Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is with great pleasure that we welcome you all to the high-level seminar on central banking, past and present challenges, organized by the Banco Central do Brasil. This seminar aims to discuss the challenges and opportunities faced by central banks in the challenging current context. So we invite to the stage for the welcoming remarks the Deputy Governor for International Affairs and Corporate Risk Management at the Banco Central do Brasil, Ms. Fernanda Guatá. Good afternoon, uh, Roberto, Mr. Fernando Haddad, governors, fellow deputy governors, invited speakers and guests. Welcome to the first high-level seminar of the Central Bank of Brazil. The aim of our gathering today is to share insights, experiences and lessons on monetary policy and central banking in general, from present and former policymakers. Cooperation and the constant sharing of insights is one of the many qualities of the central bank community. And with today's conference, the BCB also aims to share some of these discussions with a broader audience. Talking of cooperation and sharing, I would like to highlight how the staff at the BCB and its international department, DERIM in particular, work hard at keeping and improving international relationships with other central banks and international institutions. Just to give some quick numbers, the BCB had over 900 interactions with foreign counterparts in 2022 alone, embracing the relationship with other central banks, supervisory authorities, international organizations and forums, international portfolio investors, rating agencies, development agencies, government bodies, among others. The BCB actively contributed to almost 60 international working groups during the year in different areas. These interactions aim to discuss and incorporate best practices and policies, recommendations from standard setting bodies, exchanges on economic developments domestically and abroad, and also learn as much as possible from the experiences of others in order to better serve our society. All of this would not be possible without the BCB's highly committed staff. The result of these efforts is visible not only in the great lineup of today's seminar, but also in several endeavors with other central banks, monetary authorities, and international organizations. The BCB is highly regarded by its peers on the many activities it pursues, ranging from monetary policy to financial regulation, supervision practices, and the newer digital payments and green agendas. In fact, the BCB is a member of, of the board of the BIS, the IMFC at the IMF, the steering committee of the NGFS, the board of the FSB, the Junta de la Semla, as well as a recurring participant in many other um, economic global forums. In 2024, the BCB and the Ministry of Finance will be jointly organizing and hosting the finance track of the G20 in Brazil, a project which we are very excited about and very proud of being a part of. Back to today's seminar, we look forward to discussions ranging from structural challenges that have surrounded central banking to the most current challenges related to an environment of persistently high inflation, of persistently high inflation. Indeed, the past quarters have been characterized by a synchronized tightening cycle in the face of the largest inflationary spell since the 1970s. And more recently, banking stresses have further complicated the environment. But luckily, much has been learned in the previous decades to help us address this scenario the importance of central bank autonomy, inflation targeting, strong regulatory frameworks, the separation principle, and so on. Among the lessons learned are also the benefits of acting fast and being committed to low inflation, and that credibility and anchored inflation expectations are key for successful disinflations and a more predictable economy. I am sure that each panelist will add different perspectives and backgrounds to this debate today, and I very much look forward to hearing your insights. With that, I'm very pleased to give the, give the floor now to Minister Fernando Haddad, who will give the opening remarks of our seminar.
Boa tarde a todos e a todas. Eu gostaria de agradecer e cumprimentar eh, todos os organizadores desse evento, na pessoa ilustre do presidente do Banco Central do Brasil, Roberto Campos Neto, cumprimentar uh, presidentes de bancos centrais que se fazem presentes, ex-presidentes que estão presentes, autoridades monetárias, membros de organismos internacionais, e dar as boas-vindas a todos que vieram ao Brasil para esse importante evento. Gostaria também de assinalar a presença do Gabriel Galípolo, que é o meu secretário executivo, executivo e do Dario Durigan, que vai sucedê-lo no Ministério da Fazenda, é, a julgar pelo, pela sabatina do Senado, que o Galípolo vai se submeter brevemente. É, queria... É, agradecer o convite, Roberto, né, de nós estarmos juntos nessa solenidade. Penso que nós estamos dando, fazendo gestos importantes é, para criar uma nova institucionalidade no Brasil. Digo isso porque é a primeira vez que um governo é, assume com uma lei aprovada de autonomia do Banco Central. Então, o Roberto tem mandato fixo de quatro anos, vai até o final de 2024, essa transição é a primeira da história do Brasil que se faz de governo para governo, e nós estamos construindo essa relação, é, primeiro em, em relação aos técnicos de longa data, tanto do Banco Central quanto da Fazenda, mas procurando dar o exemplo de como, é, em proveito do país, harmonizar as políticas monetária e fiscal para que nós tenhamos crescimento robusto, eu sempre faço referência à obrigação que nós nos impusemos de crescer acima da média mundial. Acho que o Brasil tem a obrigação de perseguir taxas de crescimento superiores à média mundial, dado o seu potencial eh, em relação a recursos naturais, em relação a recursos humanos, em relação à tecnologia desenvolvida, tecnologia nacional. Eh, se levarmos em consideração as parcerias do Brasil com os países do mundo, nós nos colocamos essa missão e sabemos que temos muito trabalho pela frente para que isso volte a ser possível. Foi possível durante muitos anos e tem que ser possível pelos próximos anos para que nós possamos compatibilizar a, a responsabilidade fiscal, que é uma coisa muito importante para a rigidez das contas públicas, com o um compromisso que nós temos que ter com o povo brasileiro em relação às demandas sociais, legítimas demandas, de aumentar o bem-estar da sociedade. A economia ela tem que ser gerida pensando no bem-estar das pessoas. Nós somos servidores públicos, nós temos que servir a nossa gente e promover desenvolvimento com justiça social e, obviamente, em se tratando de um evento do Banco Central, com baixas taxas de inflação. Eu acredito muito que nós vamos ser bem-sucedidos nessa tarefa. O Brasil encontra-se em condições que permite vislumbrar um horizonte de desenvolvimento sustentável. O Brasil é, tomou uma providência muito é, ousada à época e que hoje foi naturalizada, da qual nosso ex-presidente Henrique Meirelles participou, que foi criar as condições já na primeira década do século, de se blindar de eventuais choques externos. Em 2006, quando o presidente Lula decidiu incrementar as reservas cambiais brasileiras, seguindo o exemplo de alguns BRICS que, à época, já tomavam a providência de se proteger, tomou a decisão de, pela primeira vez, não só pagar a dívida externa brasileira, isso foi isso foi feito no, nos primeiros dois anos de governo, mas angariar reservas internacionais que nos blindassem de choques externos. Desde então, esses choques, esses choques ocorreram. Tivemos o primeiro grande choque em 2008, tempo depois a pandemia e a, guerra, a recente guerra da Ucrânia, que já completa mais de um ano. E o Brasil, nesses episódios, é, se pre, na minha opinião, se preparou internamente para atenuar esses choques externos. Ninguém é imune a choques externos. Nós estamos vendo o que está acontecendo com as economias centrais que enfrentam taxas de inflação há muito tempo não registradas, 
com grande dificuldade de trazê-las para o centro da meta. É, e o Brasil vem experimentando é, uma condição em que as taxas de inflação se reduzem, as projeções de crescimento são revistas para cima, é, as condições internacionais, é, tanto de comércio quanto de reservas, é, pela atuação do Banco Central, inclusive, vem mostrando uma resiliência muito grande, e nós entendemos que o Brasil tem tudo para, num ambiente muito adverso, bastante adverso, nós temos tudo para sairmos na frente no próximo ciclo de expansão. Estamos nos preparando para isso, sabendo da enorme dificuldade que é fazer ah, as necess os necessárias reformas para que o nosso sistema se, se torne mais sólido. É, recebemos recentemente a missão do FMI, soltou seu primeiro relatório agora, por ocasião da, da visita técnica ao Brasil, é, assinalando os avanços que foram feitos nos últimos meses, no sentido de recobrar o, o equilíbrio das contas públicas e endereçar reformas importantes, certamente a principal das quais a reforma tributária, pode ser votada ainda no primeiro semestre na Câmara dos Deputados. Temos o segundo semestre, uma determinação do presidente Lula de lançar o Plano de Desenvolvimento do Brasil ancorado na transição ecológica, procurando transformar as nossas vantagens comparativas, que são muitas, sobretudo na área energética, em vantagens competitivas, atraindo investimentos estrangeiros para o Brasil, estimulando o investimento nacional é, e voltado para a reindustrialização do país, é, com um pensamento novo, com uma indústria nova, e com a perspectiva de tornar o solo brasileiro convidativo para boas práticas do ponto de vista ambiental e social. Eu creio firmemente né, que o atual governo vai é, endereçar essas questões, isso tem recebido da parte tanto do Congresso Nacional quanto do Supremo Tribunal Federal uma atenção bastante detida, não podemos, nesses primeiros meses do ano, reclamar de desarmonia entre os poderes, pelo contrário, tem havido um esforço muito grande, de, independentemente da posição ideológica de senadores, governador, eh, senadores, governadores, deputados ou membros do judiciário, eh, atuar na mesma direção, remar na mesma direção de criar as melhores condições econômicas para superarmos esse momento difícil. E estamos aprendendo com a experiência internacional, que está também em transformação. Eu acredito que esse conceito de autonomia do Banco Central, né, e o presidente Meirelles está aqui, sabe que antes mesmo da lei, ele foi respeitado na sua autoridade, enquanto autoridade monetária, durante os seus oito anos de mandato à frente do Banco Central. Mas nós temos que compreender que... Uh, Discutir política monetária não é afrontar a autoridade monetária. Muito pelo contrário, todos que estão nessa sala e nos assistindo sabem que estamos concorrendo para o mesmo objetivo. Então, a discussão sobre política fiscal, sobre política monetária, sobre política econômica em geral, eu sempre gosto de lembrar uma expressão do Blanchard que me parece vem ao caso, são dois braços que, do mesmo organismo. Política monetária e política fiscal não são braços de organismos diferentes. Tem que trabalhar em harmonia, tem que procurar concorrer para o mesmo objetivo, é, lembrando que não há uma mão mais importante do que a outra. Né? E, não há, e não há uma que é reativa à outra. As duas mãos têm que trabalhar ativamente em proveito da, de uma regulação adequada, é, de, um, de políticas macroprudenciais adequadas, da política monetária adequada. E sempre que eu ouço uma autoridade monetária falar que quando você está combatendo uma infecção, você tem que tomar uma cartela, toda a cartela do antibiótico, eu sempre lembro que também há a observação de que você não pode tomar duas cartelas do antibiótico. Você tem que tomar a medida certa para que a economia consiga, é, a um só tempo, se reajustar do ponto de vista é, macroeconômico e garantir as condições de crescimento sustentável 
e falo isso do ponto de vista fiscal, social e hoje ambiental. Nós não podemos deixar de considerar os, as obrigações que temos com a questão, com a agenda ambiental, se quisermos superar os riscos que estão aí assumidos é, pela ciência em relação à mudança climática. É, dito isso, eu creio que posso afirmar, é, sem, sem medo de estar sendo invasivo, que a Fazenda e o Banco Central estão procurando conversar diuturnamente a relação pessoal mais cordial possível para criar esse, esse novo espaço para nós, esse novo espaço institucional em que a população tem a confiança de que as autoridades vão fazer o seu melhor para entregar os melhores resultados para a nossa sociedade. E creio, repito, que o Brasil tem todas as condições de, em poucos meses, com tenacidade, com perseverança, sem perder o foco do que é necessário é, entregar, eu tenho certeza que nós podemos criar condições de um ciclo de desenvolvimento, e, sobretudo, se nós compararmos com as condições não apenas regionais, mas internacionais. Penso que o Brasil está em condições de oferecer é, ao mundo um, um cenário econômico muito favorável de desenvolvimento local e regional. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Roberto. We thank Mr. Fernando Haddad and also Ms. Fernanda Guardado. And now we are ready to our keynote speaker. So uh, we will invite to the stage the general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, Mr. Agustin Carstens. Well, good afternoon, all of you. I would like to start thanking Banco Central do Brasil for inviting me today. It is a pleasure to be here discussing such important issues alongside such experienced and insightful peers and colleagues. I thank very much the Brazilian hospitality. Thank you very much to Minister Haddad for his welcoming remarks and his very interesting speech. The topic of today's conference, preserving the institutional strength of central banks, is close to my heart. In my remarks today, I would like to provide some personal reflections on how to advance this goal and even more importantly, to ensure the success of public policies more broadly over the long term. In this, I draw from my experiences as both finance minister and central bank governor in Mexico. Many factors contribute to the success of public policies. The policies themselves must be well designed. The institutions delivering the policies must have sufficient resources and staff with the necessary technical skills. But there is another requirement one that, in my experience, is an even more fundamental ingredient for ensuring the success of public policies. That element is society's trust in public policies. I should begin by defining the concept of trust in public policies. Essentially, it consists in society's expectation that public authorities will act predictably in the pursuit of predefined objectives and that they will succeed in their task. Why is trust so important? If the public trusts the authorities' actions, they will incorporate them in determining their own behavior. As a result, it is more likely that the authorities will achieve their objectives. In addition, trust fuels the legitimacy of policies. With trust, the public will be more willing to accept actions that involve short-term costs 
in exchange for long-term benefits. In sum, trust is vital for policy effectiveness. Trust is acquired by achieving a number of objectives over time. Hence, the importance of setting clear policy goals, as they provide a benchmark against which policy actions can be evaluated. Their success or failure can be identified. But setting targets alone is not enough. Policymakers must also move decisively in pursuit of them, particularly when the environment changes. There is a positive feedback loop in the dynamics of trust. If policies are effective and legitimate, it is easier for the authorities to achieve their objectives, which in turn feeds back into trust, producing a virtuous cycle. However, this dynamic can also work in the opposite direction and at times very quickly. In the extreme, if trust evaporates, the capacity to make effective public policies disappears. It is therefore a constant challenge to preserve credibility and it requires consistency in public policies over time. Institutional arrangements can be very valuable for this purpose. I would like to illustrate the value of trust with a few examples. I will begin with one related to the most fundamental aspect of central banking, the nature of money. The social convention of money, as we know it today, is based on the trust placed in it by the public. And as money is the basis of the entire financial system, the system stability also depends on trust. Fiat money is an asset with no intrinsic value. Its value derives from the social convention that underpins it, together with the institution that enables it to function, the central bank. Money only has value today if the public knows that others will honor that value today and in the future. This ensures that when a person wants to use it, they know that it will be accepted and that there, is, that there will be finality in the payment. Thus, its value clearly comes from trust. This is why the issuer of money is so powerful. However, this power carries with it great responsibility. Those who abuse their ability to issue currency deprive money of its value and will be rejected by society. The consequences of the state abusing the privilege of issuing money can be disastrous. This can range from high inflation and sharp exchange rate depreciations to the abandonment of the national currency in favor of the foreign one through dollarization to, in the extreme, a return to barter as has been the result of some hyperinflationary episodes. It can also result in severe financial instability with very high costs for society in terms of economic growth, employment, inequality, and wealth. These consequences of the loss of trust in money have been a key motivation for the autonomy of central banks. After all, autonomous central banks are nothing more than an institution within the state with the mandate to preserve the purchasing power of the national currency. Autonomy is the social engineering which shores up society's trust in the central bank. As a second example, consider, consider what monetary authorities must constantly do to preserve trust in money. They must adopt monetary arrangements that allow them to anchor inflation expectations and thus preserve the purchasing power of the currency they issue. Over recent decades, most central banks have converged on inflation targeting regimes. The Banco Central do Brasil is no exception. But in what does it consist? Central banks do not directly control inflation. However, their policy tools can influence it. Through an inflation targeting regime, the central bank commits to use its tools to achieve the targets. If the public trusts the central bank 
to do what is required to keep inflation close to target, then that target, rather than the current inflation, becomes a key reference for people in making their price and wage decisions, leading to low and stable inflation. In this situation, inflation variations are usually transitory and reflect changes in relative prices. Inflation becomes self-equilibrating. The lessons from this process contains warning for the future. The trust gain can be lost if society doubts the central bank's commitment to the objective of maintaining price stability. This is one of the reasons why the recent rise in inflation in virtually every country is a cause for concern. Some generations are experiencing the risk of the economy transitioning to a high inflation regime for the first time. And once this transition starts, it can become increasingly difficult to stop. Therefore, it has been appropriate that most central banks around the world have been tightening monetary policy through higher interest rates to restore price stability. This strong response must continue as long as necessary, for only by resolve, perseverance and success in this task can trust in money be preserved. A third example concerns trust in the financial system. This is no less important than trust in the central bank itself. After all, the financial system is what links monetary policy with the real economy. That system has faced sev several challenges of late. Several of these challenges relate to the banking sector. It is well known that the money issued by the central bank is not the only money that circulates in a modern economy. In fact, it is the smallest part. What we economists refer to as commercial bank money in the form of bank deposits and credit is the bulk of it. For most people, central and commercial bank money are indistinguishable. This is not, co not the coincidence. Over time, institutional arrangements have evolved to ensure that society's trust in primary money also extends to bank money. A two-tiered monetary system is a crucial element. The central bank lays the foundation and on the first floor are commercial banks. When one company makes a payment to another, one these transactions ultimately settle on the central bank's balance sheet through the exchange of central bank money between commercial banks. This guarantees the finality of payments and the singleness of bank money. The ultimate settlement of the banking system at the central bank is made possible by the central bank's ability to create liquidity by lending to the banking system. Thus, trust in central bank money transfers to the banking system. Recent attempts to create private forms of money based on technologies that allow transactions on decentralized ledgers have highlighted the value of the two-tier monetary system. Proponents of so-called cryptocurrencies boast that these can function without central bank intervention, a lender of last resort or a reliable regulatory or supervisory framework. In reality, as cryptocurrencies have provided neither a convenient means of exchange not a stable store of value, they clearly do not replicate any of the fundamental attributes of money. But they do show that what sustains fiat money over novel technology-based alternatives is the institutional framework and the social conventions that support it. And these qualities are precisely what makes it reliable for the public. Trust in the financial system also requires stable and sol solvent financial institutions. This is why central banks and prudential regulators are tasked with monitoring financial stability and setting rules that safeguard the financial system. Recent banking failures have reminded us of the value of these safeguards. Make no mistake, the primary responsibility for events like the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic in the United States, or the takeover of Credit Suisse, 
lies with the managers of the institutions involved. But these events also underline the need for an effective super supervisory regime and mechanisms for timely intervention to prevent the failure of individual institutions from destabilizing the whole system. Brazil has been spared from turmoil in its banking sector, both recently and in past episodes, such as the great financial crisis. This results not from luck, but from the collective efforts of bank managers, supervisors, and the monetary authority. While this is good news, it should not be reason for complacency. Recent decades have also seen the rap rapid growth of non-bank financial intermediaries. This sector comprises insurance companies, investment services companies, and so on. In many countries, non-bank financial intermediation now accounts for over half of the financial system. The need for greater supervision and regulation of non-bank financial, non-bank sector has become more pressing in the light of recent episodes of instability. Instability stems from the sector interconnectedness with the tradition, traditional banking system and the tendency of different forms of non-bank intermediation to generate opaque and excessive leverage as well as substantial liquidity mismatches. Upsets in this sector can result in systemic financial crisis. In recent years, central banks have had to act as market makers of last resort to defuse crisis and preserve trust in the broader financial system. These actions may run against central banks' primary objective of price stability. This highlights how greater regulation and supervision of the non-bank financial sector seems indispensable. Within the universe of debt instruments, one is of outstanding importance. I'm referring to public debt, which if properly used, allows governments to successfully function. From a macro-financial point of view, it is important that public debt be perceived as sustainable. For this, an essential condition is that investors continue to trust the government adhere to intertemporal budget constraints without having to resort to central bank financing. This is the subject of my fourth example. Public debt plays a strategic role. It is considered the instrument with the lowest credit risk, making it essential for grounding the risk of asset portfolios, particularly those of banks. In addition, it prices, its prices are the main reference for valuing other forms of debt, for example, corporate debt. Hence, default on public debt compromise the stability of the financial system. Monetary stability could also be threatened since the conditions could arise, arise whereby, in spite of the central bank's autonomy, it would be necessary to finance debt service with primary issuance, leading for fiscal dominance of monetary policy. Under these circumstances, economies would cease to have nominal anchor and would be cased, cast adrift. The result would be rising inflation and sharp exchange rate depreciation. We can thus appreciate the vulnerabilities that can be triggered if trust in public finances is lost. All the examples I have presented illustrate that in order to have a stable monetary and financial system, it is essential to preserve trust in these three pillars of a country's macro-financial policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and financial regulation and supervision. And this must be achieved not only in each individual area, but for all policies as a whole. That is, there must be consistency among them. In practice, this represents a great challenge due to the multiple authorities involved in the existence of unavoidable political motivations, especially with regard to fiscal policy. This is not an insurmountable problem, but it certainly highlights the need for greater consistency and coordination of public policies. Institutional arrangements that facilitate this process should be enhanced in the future. 
In this regard, let me address a common misconception. Central bank autonomy has been a key development on the road to price stability, but autonomy does not mean isolation. A dialogue can, and it would, in, I would say should, exist between central banks and finance ministries. Monetary and fiscal policy are inherently linked. The policies affect each other, and together they affect economic and financial conditions, and therefore the well-being of people and investments plans of companies. Autonomy actually widens the scope for such dialogue to take place. And in this way, I fully coincide with what uh, Minister Haddad mentioned a few minutes ago. So with this, let me finish. I think that there are three key pillars in macro policy that are vital for stability, monetary, fiscal, and financial policy. They act together, they should coalesce to provide a strong foundation for the economy on which subsequent efforts in areas of government should deliver ultimate objectives, which are sustainable growth. And for that, structural reforms are also very important. So thank you very much for your attention. We thank Mr. Agustin Carthens for his speech. And now uh, the first, first session of this event. Structural challenges, autonomy, monetary policy frameworks, and reaction functions. So we invite to the stage Mr. Enrique Meirelles, former governor of Banco Central do Brasil, who will serve at this panel's moderator. We also invite to the stage the panelists, Mr. Frederico Stutzneger, former governor of the Banco Central de la República Argentina. <laughs> Mr. Stutzneger is full professor at the Universidad de San Andres, adjunct professor of, Republic, of Public Policy Harvard Kennedy School and emeritus professor Hack Paris. We invite to the stage Mr. Juan Jose Echavarria, former governor for the Banco de la República in Colombia. Mr. Echavarria served as governor of the Colombia Central Bank from, from 2017 to 2021 and as a member of the board of directors from 2003 to 2013. Mr. Raguran Rajan, former governor of the Reserve Bank of India who will join us virtually. He was the governor of the Reserve Bank of India between 2013 and 2016, vice chairman of the board of the Bank of the International for International Settlements uh, from 2015 to 2016, and chief economist at the International Monetary Fund from 2003 to 2006. Mr. Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England. Mr. Carney is an economist and banker who served as the governor of the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020. And prior to that, as governor of the Bank of Canada from 2008 until 2013. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Carney um, could not attend this event, but sent a video with his remarks. Let's watch it now. It's a great pleasure for me to participate in this Banco de Brazil seminar on the challenges for central banks. Um, and I'm gonna to speak to uh, the perspective of a central bank with remits for both price and financial stability. Because as we've learned over the years, price stability itself is far from a guarantee of financial stability. And indeed, the fundal, fundamental responsibility of central banks is to underpin the confidence in money. So that's confidence that people can use uh, currency that they trust, so no counterfeiting, widespread acceptance, 
Confidence that money goes where it should in fast, efficient, and resilient payment systems. Confidence that people can store money in banks that they are safe and sound. And confidence that money will hold its value and price stability. And each of these elements affects the other. It can be mutually enforce, reinforcing, or failure of one can undermine confidence in the rest. And I'll suggest that all of these elements will be challenged in the years ahead. Let me begin with the financial system. We're seeing with US banking turmoil, some dynamics that I think will be accentuated in coming years. Greater flightiness of deposit, expansion of FinTech driving more market-based financing. We should expect more banking as service with white label banking, greater connectivity to markets. This is gonna be better for households, uh, but it will lead to higher deposit betas, lower NIMS for banks, greater consolidation. Alongside this will be further growth in non-bank financial institutions themselves. Increased importance of money market funds in a higher interest rate environment, but also the growth, the broader growth of non-bank financial instruments as an alternate credit channel with private credit becoming the marginal uh, lender. Now, central banks yourselves will have to participate in some regulatory and supervisory adjustments. I'm not suggesting Basel IV, but more better application of Basel III tighter uh, assumptions and liquidity coverage ratio in the NSFR, and crucially, more access to central bank liquidity, uh, such as having a floating charge on balance sheets or pre-positioning collateral. It is possible that in some jurisdictions, deposit insurance will be expanded, but that really underscores the importance of reliance on bail-in. Um, so overall, this greater role for money uh, market-based finance uh, these risks will need to be balanced through greater redemption term, greater use of redemption terms, swing pricing consistent with the underlying risks of the assets. One other development in the financial system I would suggest is that recent developments underscore the case for central bank digital currencies. Seeing the failures of supervision in money market, uh, mutual funds, uh, in the asset liability management of banks, um, it does call into question the wisdom of having stable coins at the heart of the payment system, because after all, they rely on flawless ALM and robust 24 7, 365 supervision over decades. As, this, as the BIS has reminded us, the Bank of Amsterdam provides an ample lesson. So you have, uh, you will participate as central banks, I think in important design choices around CBDCs, a need to coordinate with governments on privacy, cross-border applications, and a support for private innovation. But the core implication of all of these developments is an increase in wholesale funding and financial markets, including banking, greater credit differentiation, and I'd argue greater traction for monetary policy. That brings me to the second big structural challenge, which is one to price stability caused by the biggest regime change in the global economy since the fall of the Berlin Wall. As has been much discussed, we're moving from globalization to a form of fragmentation, or at least a rewiring of the global economy. We're moving from neoliberalism to neo-mercantilism, from energy insecurity to sustainability, and from an emphasis on efficiency to a greater emphasis on resilience. And this, this will replace a long period of economic convergence and disinflationary forces brought on by a combination of technological change, global integration, and deficient demand in, uh, supplanted by more inflationary pressures from these series of supply shocks, fiscal largesse, and a potential investment boom. Of course, Given your roles and your expertise, it doesn't mean our economies are condemned to high inflation, but the ability to achieve price stability targets will be affected by these broader structural forces, by the monetary policy transmission mechanism I just discussed, but also I'd suggest by changes to the equilibrium rate or neutral rate or R star. The IMF has recently argued that it's likely to return to its pre-pandemic low um, I think they did a service in emphasizing that the increased international correlation of R-star during the long period of globalization is coming to an end, and that we'll have greater variance across countries. But I think on balance, the forces on R-star will push it up. Yes, demographics will continue to weigh on it, 
and the distribution of income inequality uh, will do the same. Both of those factors move slowly. But overall, with respect to debt, lower indebtedness of households has made them less responsive to interest rates. That which should move up our star. And uh, fiscal uh, easing should also uh, reinforce that, given the structural forces of reliance on resilience over efficiency. The process of decarbonization, the move towards net zero, brings an additional two percentage points of investment. Deglobalization will also increase domestic investment. And finally, uh, the balance of risks in the global economy have shifted. Uh, it's not just a question of uh, moving from asymmetric risks, uh, uh, deflationary uh, environment, but uh, towards uh, more symmetric and possibly upside risk to inflation with fatter uh, tails. So on balance, um, the secular drivers of reflation, inflation are replacing those of disinflation. There's a firming of investment relative to savings, which themselves will fragment and on balance, I would think our star will be higher. Time will tell. The third factor I wanted to mention was the implications of some of these developments for the strategy and conduct of monetary policy in the medium term. Improvements in liquidity management, moving towards what uh, my predecessor, Mervyn King, Lord King, has called uh, the pawnbroker of all seasons or of last resort, uh, providing greater liquidity both for banks and non-bank financial institutions. The, one of the many advantages of that approach is it will maximize the ability of central banks to follow the se separation principle. As well, the shift in the uh, dynamics in the financial system will mean, should mean, I should say, that monetary policy transmission may gain traction. And this will imply a lower lambda or weight on output uh, deviations. It's an open question whether there's merit in incorporating financial stability considerations into the conduct of monetary policy. I'd argue that those uh, these issues in financial stability underscore the importance of sound regulation, tight, to, su tight supervision, and effective macroprudential policies, including the liquidity measures that I mentioned. So to conclude on that, over the course of the medium term, Bank funding will become more competitive. There'll be greater credit differentiation between banks and their funding will likely become more volatile as conditions change. This will be reinforced by the ongoing spread of FinTech and non-bank finance. Central bank liquidity backstops will need to become more pervasive and expansive and the pass through of monetary policy will become more immediate and significant. On balance, that could mean that our reaction functions, your reaction functions, could yield greater perceived weight to output deviations, both to, due to shorter lags and some elements of financial stability. To conclude, I'd like to thank you again uh, for this invitation, and I'd like to take this opportunity to salute our host, Governor uh, Roberto, for your excellent leadership of the Banco do Brasil, uh, and by extension of the global central banking community. Thank you very much. So now uh, the floor is now given to the moderator of this panel, Mr. Enrique Meirelles. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Initially, I would like to address this question of uh, the central bank uh, mandate and the central bank uh, roles and the challenges and the change. Evidently, uh, as we know uh, very well, the basic mandate of the central bank is the uh, control of inflation, inflation on target, and uh, as it has been experienced by central banks and by countries all over the world, uh, in the long run, uh, the only way to maximize growth and maximize uh, jobs uh, creation is control inflation, even if it has or creates short-term growth problems as a result of higher interest rates, etc. But then having said that, I would like to address another interesting question, is the, the, the point which was already mentioned, financial stability. 
uh, not only the financial stability of the financial system itself, but of the country as well. Uh, as it was mentioned e even by the, the, the minister, uh, we were able to build substantial amount of reserves uh, for Brazil uh, during the period from 2003 to 2010, when uh, we reached the level of uh, more than $300 billion of reserve. That was very important. Actually, it, it reminds me of a meeting of uh, the BIS uh, when I was there representing Brazil and a uh, uh, discussion at that time, it was the question of the excess liquidity and it was uh, on the, we were running towards the 2007 crisis, 2008, et cetera. Uh, which was not created by the sex of uh, countries' reserves, evidently, but that, that there was a concern about reserves. And it was the concern was exacerbated by China's growth of reserves in the sense that they had at that time uh, building, were building reserves to reach more than trillion dollars, etc. And having said that, one of uh, presidents, another president of the Central Bank, <coughs> turned to me and said, Enrique, uh, I don't need reserves. Uh, and why do you need reserves? And I, I looked at him and said, the day you call us an advanced economy, we will not need reserves anymore. And that's basic the point. The fact is that this reserves building, uh, it created the conditions to stabilize not only the country's financial system, but the country itself. During the crisis of 2008, for instance, uh, there was a collapse of the uh, lending lines to Brazil, the international, the cross-border lines. Because of the collapse, particularly of the American financial system at that time, and to some extent of some Europeans. And uh, that represented about 20% of the total credit in Brazil. As a result of that, there was a credit crunch. And, and that was growing, becoming a very serious problem. There was a, a fall in the GDP as a result of that. And uh, we solved that problem announcing that Central Bank of Brazil would lend to banks to own land to companies, replacing the international financial system entirely for the period of one year regarding their loans to Brazil. That addressed the problem. And that means that at that, at that moment, Central Bank of Brazil not only addressed the question of financial stability of the country, but of the financial system as well. In summary, I would like to uh, start with those points to basically uh, begin the discussions about this question, which is the, the main point today of central bank's mandate and, and the, the role of the central bank in the economic policy mix, et cetera, et cetera. We will start first uh, listening from Federic, Federico Sturzenegger, who is former governor of Banco Central de la República Argentina. Uh, today he is a full professor at the Universidad de San Andrés and adjunct professor of public policy at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Uh, and he is also an emeritus professor at HEC Paris. He holds a PhD in economics from MIT and was an assistant professor of economics at UCLA and chief economist of YPF. And he, was, he is uh, dean as well, uh, was dean of the business school at Ditella from 98 uh, until 2000, and 2002 to 2005. In summary, I'll stop here, but he has a longer uh, <laughs> curricula. Anyway, Federico, please go ahead. I think I have some slides. I don't know if we have them, and I need something to, to move the slides. Thank you. Here. Here. So this is this. Let's see. No. 
that's working, and then this. Again. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto, for the invitation. It's it's a real pleasure to be here to share this panel with former colleagues, CEO, old friends, and. Um, well, you know, when they ask me to talk about inflation, I always have to make this caveat uh, coming from Argentina. You know, here we're, here we're to explain from our failings, not from our successes, okay? We, we may have had some successes in financial regulation or payments, but uh, certainly not in monetary policy. But uh, I think sometimes there are more, this is, there's more to learn from the failures than from the successes. So, okay, so, so the topic here is structural challenges, autonomy, Monetary policy frameworks and reaction functions, 15 minutes, okay? So I said, what do I do with this, okay? Uh, so I started, I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with what I think is the most important paper written in macroeconomics in the post-war period, which is uh, the 1983 Barrow Gordon paper in the Journal of Political Economy. And if you take this paper, this paper has a very simple idea, and the idea is that you have a central bank which is concerned about output, if inflation is very low, then the central bank is going to be tempted to generate a bit of inflation to expand output. But people are, go are not silly, as Agustin has already has told us. People are going to anticipate that. They're going to put that into their expectations. And the end result of that uh, equilibrium is going to be that you're going to have a high inflation with now no effect on output. So this paper actually provided, say, the intellectual underpinning for the independence of the central bank, which at the same time, Paul Volcker was basically showing that it worked in the, in the practical world. So the combination of David Gordon and, and Volcker, I think, provided the framework with which the world uh, was able to uh, reduce inflation over the next uh, following decades, uh, bringing, I think, uh, immense welfare to, 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 to many countries. So in, in this sense, I think uh, maybe I I want to propose a different uh, metaphor for the body metaphor that the minister Adad said. Like he said, you know, monetary policy and fiscal policy, like two, I, th I think, no, I think fiscal policy is both arms and central policy, uh, central bank is the heart. But not, I'm not trying to say that one is more important than the other, correct? I'm just saying that they work at a different level because central banks work long term and fiscal policy works short term. So what's visible, what's moving are the arms, which is fiscal policy, but the arms need a healthy body. And a healthy body means low inflation, a price system that works, and that's what you need the central bank to do. So you don't want to put the central bank to do what the arms do, and you don't want to put the, arm to do the, the arms to do what the heart does, okay? So uh, of course they're both in the same body, they have to work in, in a symbiotic way, they have to coordinate, but they do different functions. I think we need to we need to kind of be aware of that. Okay, so 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 the idea of uh, of Barrow Gordon was well, if a central bank creates trust and has credibility, then it will able be able to convince people that inflation is going to be low, and therefore there's going a welfare gain because eventually you are not going to have any gain in terms of output. So the the, the name of the game is how to build credibility to have a lower uh, in inflation in equilibrium. And I think the world has basically found three ways of doing this. And uh, one is in the institutional framework. One is in the monetary policy framework. And one is in the reaction function. So actually, I realized that this paper allowed me to think about the three things that were in the topic. Because the reaction function is the people, the governor, the team, the board. The monetary policy framework is what kind of monetary policy I'm going to implement. And the institutional framework is autonomy. It's what's the institutional framework within which the central bank is operating, okay? So, so the question is, how do you build credibility from these three things? Can we know which one of these three things is more important? Okay, so I said, uh, let me try the following exercise. And actually, this is from a paper that I'm writing now, right now. And I'm going to, in this paper, I'm going to define economies which are super stabilizers. Okay, what is a super stabilizer economy? A super stabilizer economy is an economy that for some time had more than 20% inflation in a chronic manner, and then something happened and they brought inflation below 20% and never again saw 20%. So never, never again went back to 20%. So I call this the super stabilizers. 
they went from a chronic high inflation to low inflation and never came back, okay? I'm going to look at countries since 1990, so this is the last three years. And when you look at what, which countries, how many countries do we have that were in that situation, more than 20% brought it down, there are 45 cases in the world. All right, so let me just introduce to you which are those 45 cases, okay? So remember, these are countries that had chronic inflation and brought it down for good, okay? So of course, we have a, a lot of countries in South America, including the one we're, we're in right now. Um, unfortunately, my country is not there. I, I thought I was going to take it there, but I didn't succeed, okay? Of course, Mexico. Then we have all the countries in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, which also in the 1990s made this transition from high inflation to low inflation. And then we have a, a bunch of countries in mostly Eastern Africa. Okay, so what can we, what can we, what, what can we learn about these countries which were successful in bringing down inflation? Well, the first thing is, when did these stabilizations happen? Well, 30 of them happened in the 1990s, 13% of them in the 2000s, and then basically not much more in the, in the 2010s. So this is kind of something that has happened already a while ago. And where did they happen? As I mentioned, 18 countries in Europe, 11 in Africa, 11 in Latin America, and five in Asia. We already, we knew that Asia typically has lower inflation rates. What did they do? What was the monetary policy framework that these super successful stabilizer countries implemented? And I'm going to split that in countries which did kind of more or less foreign exchange, an exchange rate-based stabilization, and countries which did more like a monetary-based stabilization. And when you look at it, you see that it's kind of evenly split. If you look here at the bottom of the table, you have 24 which are monetary-based and 20 which are for, there's one which is Belarus that we kind of read and we couldn't figure out what they were doing. So we just said, okay, let's call that hybrid, okay? And now if you go to the monetary, the monetary also is of three types. The, um, remember, I'm talking about these super stabilizers. Uh, one is basically that they did monetary policy, okay? So they had aggregates, they kind of committed to some sort of uh, monetary rule. Uh, some of those migrated eventually to an inflation targeting regime. So you went from a monetary kind of anchor to an inflation targeting regime. And some started with some kind of exchange rate rule, like it may be a band or a managed float, whatever, and they migrated to an inflation targeting regime with a, with a floating exchange rate regime, which is, more, you're basically based on monetary policy now, okay? So you have 24, so I said, okay, this is not it. This is not really, I mean, you can do fi fixed exchange or you can do monetary. This is not what defines a successful stabilizer. Like, both are fine. Now, the interesting thing is when we started looking at the institutional context here, and the, what was happening in these economies when these stabilizations took over, when these stabilizations happened. Remember, these are very sustainable stabilizations. And we realized that in most of these countries, a very big political things were happening. Maybe there was a consolidation of a power, of, a, well, we may not like some of those, like for example, Putin, whatever, but it was a consolidation of power. Some had constitutional changes. Some were migrating from one economic system to another, like the Eastern European countries, which were living communism. Um, some had civil wars that ended. So there was, a, there was a fundamental institutional change in the country which created the institutional environment for central banks to operate. So for me, this basically means the monetary framework perhaps is not so important. You have flexibility there to the extent that the institutional political framework in the economy is there that sustains central bank independence and allows the central bank to do what it. And then, of course, you have some countries that we didn't find anything and we couldn't find any big thing. So, well, this is basically the, the board, correct? This is the, the people. This is, this is the, the persons who are implemented this, okay? So, I, I, now, of course, we have twice as much. And then some countries, they do the stabilizations after a big crisis. So, uh, so I, I take these numbers as suggesting that the institutional framework in which a central bank operates is, uh, is very important. Now, let me just um, 
tell you about the issue of the institutional framework and the monetary policy framework in Argentina. So in Argentina, we have a, a framework where the central bank is not independent. The president can remove the president of the central bank whenever. So if you're going to build credibility on the basis of the team, on the basis of a framework and a basis of the institutions, well, Argentina was lacking the institutional part. Okay? So you had to be very strong in the message that you're giving, in communicating what you're doing, in aiming your objectives, and being very consistent with that in order to solve the Barro Gordon issue that we discussed at the beginning, which is building credibility. So when Macri, the, the period I was governor, which was between the end of 2015 and, and the early months of 2018, uh, we established a framework and that inflation was an inflation targeting with uh, four year targets for the inflation rate. And the, what you can see there is, let's say the, the dashed line is the core inflation, the three month moving average. And you can see how that inflation came down very, very quickly. And of course, you have to understand that the numbers are large in Argentina, okay? But it's coming down. So you can see a very steady process of decreasing inflation. And what's more surprising is that this process of decreasing inflation came in a context of economic growth. In 2017, towards the second half, the economy was growing at a 5% rate. Now, what happened is that the government wins the midterm elections in 2017. Interest rates were relatively high in real terms, which was consistent with what we were doing for inflation targeting. And there, a big lobby from, I would say, the industrialists wanted lower interest rates. And they wanted lower interest rates, they wanted lower interest rates, they wanted lower interest rates. And eventually the government decided that they was going to change the inflation targets in order to push the central bank to lower the interest rates. And, well, I remember discussing this with Agustin and and Juan Jose and other colleagues and the, the how dangerous this move was. Because remember, Argenti Argentina doesn't have the institutional framework, had the monetary rule as a way of anchoring expectations. So if you don't have the institutional and you lose the rule, you're kind of in dangerous territory. Okay. So eventually at the end, after very significant discussions, the government decided to change the targets at the end of 2017. And immediately, the inflation process and the expectation process de-anchored. Because remember, this was a government which was saying, I want to have more inflation. And uh, you, sorry, you basically see it here. I don't know if I have a pointer here. Oh, yes. So this is the inflation rate. So you see how it had, it had continued to come down. And then you can see how immediately things derailed after the change in the inflation targets. OK, I left a few months, a few months later. So what happened to output? Because remember, the whole idea was the pressure to lower interest rates in order to improve output. Look what happened to output. So output, which had been growing very healthily during this period, where interest rates were high and inflation was coming down, basically turned itself uh, upside down. And, uh, and then you enter into a protracted recession. This big drop was a big drought that we had in the first half of the year, but then you see the economy had no ability to recover because as the monetary framework uh, weakened, that fed into political instability, capital outflows, etc. So, so, I mean, it, it starts getting complicated once, once you kind of lost the, the anchoring. And I want, at the last slide I want to show, and then I'm going to conclude, is uh, this one. I have to confess I had prepared this for Minister Adad, okay, but uh, he left, but... Uh, Anyway, we'll make sure that he gets it, okay? Uh, this is, uh, look at this. This is very, this graph is very interesting because uh, this is the spread of Argentinian bonds in dollars. So there's no currency issue here, okay? So what we have here before, here before the change in the targets is the spread of Argentina, the, 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 the line, and then this green dashed line is, let's say, what we call a, a group of comparables. And you can see that, that Argentina was, was behaving as a, any normal emerging market country. And then this vertical line here is the change of targets, and this is the next day, okay? This is the next day. And the next day you can see, and this is hugely statistically significant, you can see a widening up 
of the difference between the emerging market spreads and the spread of Argentinian bonds. So this basically means that uh, the, um, I'm, I'm finishing, uh, Enrique. Um, this basically means that the change in targets was not only seen as a change, a weakening of central bank autonomy and a weakening of monetary policy. It was seen as a weakening of the institutional framework also for fiscal policy. So also there was pressure on the government to change the targets so we can finance ourselves cheaper. They ended up financing themselves much more expensive. That's why I say a central bank needs to keep the body healthy. The body healthy is low financing cost, um, low inflation, the price system working, etc. Let me let me conclude with uh, with one um, bringing up a metaphor that Agustin Carstens used to tell us less experienced uh, governors in our, in the, our global economic meeting at the BIS. And Agustin Carstens basically said, look, what's the difference between a finance minister and a central bank governor? Well, the finance minister is you get up in the morning, you get into a jet fighter, okay? And you go out and you fight and you scream. And then at night you get back at home and you're a little bit bruised and say, okay, I'm still alive. And then the next day you get on the jet fighter again, okay? That's it. The central bank governor, it's not on a jet fighter, it's on an Airbus 380. So it has a lot of people, okay? So you, you have to do a smooth ride, you plan, you have to go from here to there. Now, if you have trouble in the plane, okay, you have a lot of people with you on the plane, okay? And it's a, it's a big trouble. So I think the, um, the institutional framework is that, it's planning your trip. It's staying, uh, staying your course because if at the first turbulence you start kind of steering the wheel and going this way and going that way, I think you won't make it, you know, and it's going to be more miserable at the end of the day. So let me finish with, with this. So, so Agustin, I kind of added that little twist to your, to your anecdote, to your metaphor. I want to say the following. We said, how do you build credibility? With rules, with institutions, and with a team. So if you have the institutions, you have the rules, and you have the team, I was having to change anything, you know, look, I just saw what I showed you from Argentina, okay? I tell you, you may be happy even if you don't know it. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, now, we'll listen to Mr. Uh, Juan Jose Echevarria. And a member of the board of directors from 2003 to 2013. In those years, he was a member of the Small and Open Economies and of the Governance Group at the Bank of International Settlements, the BIS, and chair of the Latin America Monetary Center Board of Directors. He got his uh, PhD degree in economics from Oxford University and has been teaching macroeconomics, econometrics, and international trade at the Los Andes and other Colombian universities. He was the Dean of the Economic Faculty of the National University of Columbia in 84, 85, uh, several other uh, tasks and functions after that. He works today at Federal and at the University of Los Angeles. Uh, please, Governor. Thank you, Enrique. Um, Governor Roberto, Agustin, Federico, it's a pleasure to be with you at Brazil. Um, I'm going to, to use my 15 minutes. Answer some of the questions that you pre that present to us um, in, the, in the organization of the panel. Um, I move this from here, right? How do you do it? Huh? Oh, the green one. Okay, so I'm going to present um, six slides. Uh, the first thing, let, let me tell you something about institutions uh, to start with. Um, I, I heard this uh, conference by a, a Chilean Minister of Trade, 
And he said that in Chile, he, he used to tell business people, you are very similar to the business people in Argentina. But uh, here you can work in Argentina, it's very difficult, but you are very similar. That's the best example I have about institutions working or not working. Business people can work with they have, when they have good institutions. Um, so let me, t let me present my six slides. Colombia, still inflation is high. Um, these are projections for, from surveys uh, which still talk about 11% for 2023 and more than 4% through the 24. The, the projections of the central bank are more optimistic. They took about 7% in 20, end of 23 and 4% 24, but inflation has been high in Colombia recently. Um, so the, the second slide presents some evidence about the, the behavior of inflation through time. I left the central bank December of 2020, I ne and I never imagined that the world was going to change so much next year. Agustin, we were at the BIS. Every governor was talking about how to increase inflation. The Americans were talking about the new, the new plan to increase inflation, Jap everybody. Well, in Colombia, we had 1.5 lower than the 2% the lower range of, of the range. Uh, so inflation started increasing, and finally last month is decreasing a little bit, but very high. Um, and mainly because food prices are decreasing, finally. But if you take uh, some measures of, um, core in of, of headline inflation, it's still very high, and it's not very clear that it's decreasing. Now, the projections of the central bank for inflation and growth are more optimistic. They talk about uh, getting the, the, the target in two years. Um, growth has been very high the last previous years in Colombia, maybe one of the largest in the world. Uh, but for, easy, for this year, they are expecting 1%, uh, 1.5%, uh, which is important too. Now, the, the exchange rate uh, has been increasing, despite uh, the central bank increasing rates much faster than in the United States, mainly due to risk. When you compare the behavioral exchange rate in Colombia with Latin America, you see that it's moving upwards much faster, though recently it has been coming down a little bit. And mainly it's because risk measured by these credit default swaps has been increasing a lot. We had these, uh, these uh, paros in Colombia, May 2021, um, a fiscal reform failed, um, and um, the international calificadoras decreed that we went into, into, into a, a not, not investment grade, and you see the consequences. The, the, the CDS have been increasing much faster, we were like Mexico before, close to Peru and, and uh, Chile, and now we are even higher than Brazil. Um, and it's, relate, it's not very related with the price of oil. It's mainly due to risk, the behavior of the exchange rate. And the final, the final slide is related to, um, to the fiscal issue. So as Agustin was, was Mentioning debt is one of the important key variables, and uh, I was also going to. I'm going to also going to talk about the the price of gasoline. So debt has been increasing very fast, mainly in Brazil, in the in this graph, but also in Colombia. In the last years, we we the GDP increased so fast that it has been stable, but we we are still uh, above uh, Mexico ab about. Chile and Peru. So those are the slides. Um, now, talking about the, the questions that Enrique and the, the, the organizers uh, ask, they, they, they ask about biggest challenges, they ask about mandates and opportunities, they ask about evolution of the central bank autonomy, and they ask about uh, balance between monetary and fiscal policy. 
So first of all, I come from one of what Federico called one of the super stabilizers. It sounds great, super stabilizers. It's, it's, it's not a, as good as, as it sounds, but let's, let's uh, talk about that. Um, and I will, I will mention three issues, uh, listening to Federico. First, a constitution, a new constitution, was very important in the history of Colombian inflation, as we mentioned. Second, inflation targeting has worked well in the country. I remember again the discussion with Federico uh, at the BIS, and you had all the discussions about inflation target, but inflation targeting takes time. It took lots of time in Colombia. We came from a country with 23% average inflation for 20 years. And to decrease that took lots of time, and it took a crisis, 1999 crisis, in which finally inflation came down and the people in Colombia were finally convinced that inflation was going to, to be low for a long time. So, biggest challenges, I will say that the challenges are the standard ones, to convince people that inflation has to, has to be in the target, and that the inflation can be achieved with uh, sustainable growth. Of course, you always have this discussion about short term, but uh, as Federico and, and Enrique mentioned and Agustin, um, you, can, you can have same growth, Baron Gordon, with low inflation. And it's important to convince people we can do that. Communication is not easy because, uh, first of all, uh, Colombia has been increasing rates double than in, in the United States, as, as, I, I, as I show in the graph. And if in the United States and the developed countries, it's difficult to explain it in our countries, it's even more difficult because the increase in the rates is double of, of in, the, in these other countries. Um, it's, not, it's not easy to explain people that you have to reduce growth now a little in order to avoid reducing growth a lot in the future once expectations are in the economy. Um, and finally, I think that uh, the job is done in the Central Bank of, of Colombia. Leonardo Villar is going to talk later on. Maybe they have to increase rates a little bit more, but the main job has been done. Um, I will say that the, the, uh, another big challenge is how to induce more competition among banks. We have few banks in a very close environment. There is a lot of discussion of how to introduce more competition uh, among the, the monetary system, uh, among the central, the, the, the bank system, excuse me. Um, second, there are questions about mandates and opportunities. Uh, I remember the, the discussions, again, Agustina, the BIS, in which uh, the Australian governor said that their mandate was very good because they talk about welfare for the people. And he said, well, once the mandate is welfare for people, it's very easy to explain everything. In Europe, you have very, very strict uh, mandate. In the States, you have this very complicated mandate. I think what we have in Brazil, in Colombia, in our countries, is okay. We, we want to reduce inflation to the target, growing at the potential level. And that's the mandate. I, I, feel, I, I think we, we feel very co comfortable with that mandate. Um, the, the other thing is that inflation targeting is, seems to have been working well in Colombia. If uh, we inflation and potential growth, interest rate is the main policy. We, in the, in the crisis of 1999, we learned that we must float. We tried to intervene in the markets, but we learned very, very quickly that we, that was very ineffective. In Colombia, intervention is very small, if at all. And, um, and um, with presentation to Congress, so we feel com comfortable with the, with the scheme we have. Now, the third question, about autonomy. I have four minutes, uh, Ricky. So um, I think that uh, what we have been learning in Colombia is also good for the central bank. 
in some sense, we have a very autonomous central bank. The governor is appointed by the board, not even by the president. Is, is, is uh, elected by the board, and every, the, every president appoints two members every four years. These members appoint the government. Um, and this, the second point is that the central bank mandate was a result of the new constitution of 1991. And in Colombia, the new constitution of 1991, now the old constitution, is very well appreciated. And most people say one of the strong achievements of that new constitution was the independence of the central bank. And I think that has been very important. Um, most presidents complain about the central bank. They complained every time the poor Mr. Villar increased rates. When I was governor, I never increased rates, all the time down. <laughs> so I was a hero. Uh, though Volker said that if you don't increase rates, you are never a central banker. So mixed feelings. Um, but I think they are all, almost ready. I hope they already did what they had to do. So I feel comfortable, comfortable about autonomy. And finally, the, the last question about monetary and fiscal policies. As I, as I mentioned, uh, Colombian debt is high. For one century, Colombia had debt levels of 20%, 10%, 20% of GDP. Now it's 60, 60 something. Um, most uh, studies said that uh, a sustainable level sh sh should be something like 55%, 50. So it's not terrible, it's high. Uh, but this government has been taking some good measures for fiscal policy. Uh, uh, left government. I think the Minister of Finance at the Central Bank have been doing the job. Um, and the Central Bank, when I was governor, I never felt fiscal dominance in the sense that you shouldn't, you shouldn't raise rates because the government is going to be in trouble in the fiscal front. And I think Leonardo has been, has been feeling that either. Um, a new fiscal reform was achieved. That was important. Uh, the government has returned to the fiscal rule, which was abandoned during the, pan the pandemic. And finally, the price of gasoline has been increased finally. That was a huge problem because it was a deficit like 3% of GDP. So in that sense, I, I feel that the government is also doing the fiscal job. Uh, the government has been proposing some reforms in the health, in health, uh, in the pension system, and that's going to be important. But on the whole, I think that the fiscal uh, job has been done too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we are going uh, to listen uh, by video. Uh, to the former governor of the Reserve, uh, the Reserve Bank of India, Raghuran uh, Rajan. Raghuran Rajan is the Catherine uh, Duzak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance of the University of Chicago's Booth School. He was the governor of the Reserve Bank of India between 2013 and 2016, vice chairman of the board of the Bank of, for International Settlement for 2000. 15 to 16, and chief economist of the International Monetary Fund from 2003 to 2006. Uh, Dr. Rajan's research interests are in banking, corporate finance, and economic development. His book, Fault Lines, won the Financial Times Prize for Best Business Book in 2010, and his most recent book, The Third uh, Pillar, how Markets and the State Hold the Community Behind was a finalist for the award in 2019. Mr. Rajam, thank you. Uh, please, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, splendid conference. It's always hard to come after such compelling speakers, many of whom are friends from the central bank uh, community. 
I want to uh, address two issues, uh, which will build on some of what we've already heard. I mean, we are in a period of very high inflation uh, with worries about financial stability. And of course, these are the two critical concerns or functions of the central bank. And the question is, how much responsibility do central banks have for generating these two worries? And uh, second, um, you know, once we deal with all this, how should central bank frameworks change given what we know as and when inflation is conquered? So um, I uh, have a rule of not speaking about the Reserve Bank of India ever since I left office. Uh, it complicates my successes uh, policies. So I will use the Fed as an example, not because I think it's particularly instructive, but of course, because it's the most important central bank in the world. Um, let me start with a basic question. Uh, why are we in the current situation? Uh, clearly the pandemic and the huge fiscal and monetary stimulus changed much and in unexpected ways. And I don't want to repeat uh, what you already know, but much had changed before we got there, right? And uh, Mr. Echevarria uh, pointed to some of this, that uh, we had this post global financial crisis uh, period of lowflation. Uh, central banks were not achieving their inflation target. US PC inflation averaged about 1.4% from 2012 to 2020, clearly below the 2% target. So under the assumption that inflation is always a monetary phenomenon, it was up to the central bank to fix it. And so the political pressure on the central bank mounted in a time of low growth. Uh, essentially, the idea was that the central bank is not meeting its target. There must be some stimulus it is not delivering. And I remember talking to some of my colleague central bankers, and uh, uh, they, they were reflecting this pressure that came from the political side. Now, in that world, uh, it was it was a new problem because we had never thought that too low inflation would be a problem. Certainly not in the problem, uh, not a problem in the models that Federico talked about. And uh, you know, central bankers suffered from a little bit of hubris, saying that you know we could always deal with the problem of too low inflation, and if fiscal policy and structural reforms were not working, monetary policy would do the job of bringing inflation up and potentially also uh, benefiting growth. Now, while I think central banks knew how to bring down inflation and thought they knew how to bring up inflation, there was no obvious playbook. Uh, I mean, Japan had tried for a long time and not succeeded. And uh, the playbook was especially difficult when uh, nominal interest rates were at zero. So um, central banks uh, in the industrial world in the period between the global financial crisis and the pandemic uh, did a bunch of things uh, you know, to try and achieve the inflation mandate. Some of it was very, very needed, unconventional monetary policy to repair markets. Uh, all of us remember uh, uh, President Draghi's uh, you know, statement that uh, within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. That was the uh, OMT policy, which was actually never uh, needed to be implemented, just open talk uh, dealt with the problem. But that was an example of the new uh, sort of policies that were rolled out to deal with the problems of broken markets. But some unconventional monetary policy was also an attempt to give monet a monetary boost while at the zero lower bound. Uh, clearly, uh, the most important example of this was quantitative easing, which attempted to alter asset prices through asset purchases, including of government debt, and also in the process give some certainty about uh, you know, how long monetary policy would stay accommodative. Um, and uh, another sort of uh, version, uh, another tool that was used, uh, perhaps uh, uh, a little less uh, central was forward guidance, uh, which was an attempt to convince markets, uh, again, through talk that the central bank would stay for long. And there's a hope that this combination of forward guidance and quantitative easing would tend to be very convincing. But it didn't stop there, as Mr. Echeverria uh, suggested. Uh, the Fed went further and actually changed uh, its framework. Uh, 
I, I believe this was an attempt to actually implement Paul Krugman's suggestion that uh, central bank commit to being more relaxed about inflation or be rationally irresponsible in his words. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Fed indicated it would no longer be preemptive in heading off inflation. Instead, it would be measured and reactive. And it would want to see inflation being sustainable before acting. Also, by focusing on average inflation over an undefined period, it could all allow higher inflation for a while and not be criticized for falling behind the curve. And of course, it stressed that the employment goal is broad-based and inclusive, affecting all parts of the labor market. And this was important because it meant that it would wait to see minorities uh, you know, achieve some level of employment. And since minorities, unfortunately, are the last to be hired in the U.S. labor market, this meant that the Fed could potentially tolerate a tighter labor market than in the past. So, um, you know, the Fed changed frameworks just in time for the world to change with COVID. You all know the fiscal and monetary actions that took place, but I want to talk about the consequences for central bank policy. We all I have heard even in this panel about fiscal dominance, but we are experiencing two other forms of dominance. Uh, one which uh, held the Fed back was framework dominance. After all, that's what frameworks are meant to be. Uh, so in the past, as soon as you saw signs of higher inflation, you would react. I mean, remember the famous saying in the Fed, if you see inflation in the eyeballs, it's too late. So it was a reactive policy. And now that was thought to be overly aggressive. You had to wait and see it, stare at it, and ensure it was sustainable before you reacted. Uh, I think the term that was used during this period was transitory. It turned out, of course, that this put the Fed behind the curve. Uh, you know, but I, I, I think it was consistent with the new framework, which not only allowed the Fed to wait, it mandated the Fed to wait till it was sure the, the inflation was sustained. So the Fed delayed and had to catch up with sharp increases in interest rates. But a second form of concern uh, then emerged because during the period of low rates, uh, the Fed has all, had also engaged in substantial amounts of QE. Central bank balance sheets expanded tremendously. And uh, one counterpart of uh, central bank balance sheet expansion that has gotten less attention is that commercial banks also expand their balance sheets. And typically they expand their balance sheets by buying, by holding reserves financed with uninsured demandable deposits. Um, some banks went further and not only uh, sort of held those reserves, but shifted those res reserves to liquid long-term securities, believing that long-term rates would be stable. And in the short run, this gave them a carry spread. In other words, we had asset liability mismatches generated by a search for yield at the commercial bank, incentivized by the tremendous fund inflow into the commercial banks and the view that risk was small. Clearly, this was a place where if we were to achieve monetary uh, uh, and financial stability separation, the supervisors should have paid closer attention. But sometimes when there's a lot of money moving at short notice, it's hard for the supervisors to do their job. And this is why I think that kind of separation rarely happens in practice. So the uh, system was in fact uh, somewhat more fragile when QE shifted to QT and interest rates went up substantially. Uh, there's a saying that is doing the rounds from a JP Morgan analyst, when the Fed applies brakes, suddenly someone is ejected through the windscreen. Uh, we just don't know who. Well, with all the liquidity risk and solvency risk that had been built up in the system, these came to the fore when the central bank started shrinking its balance sheet and raising rates simultaneously, uh, we had runs once again uh, after, you know, not, not even, um, you know, uh, 12 years after the global financial crisis. But it's not just the runs which are a problem. A lot of mid-sized banks have seen a steady loss in profitability, even while having losses on their balance sheet. This does suggest a substantial amount of uh, of either recapitalization or restructuring will be needed. Hopefully it's slower than the kind of runs we've seen uh, recently. 
So the Fed must be uh, wary now of financial sector volatility, which hampers monetary policy. Too much of an additional increase in interest rates, and it increases the bank's cost of funding, which given the long duration of some of the assets, makes the banks unprofitable and therefore unviable. Too much of an increase in inflation, on the other hand, increases long rates, which makes mark-to-market losses much larger on bank balance sheets, which makes them insolvent. So it's, you know, pick your poison. Which one do you pick at this point? Hopefully neither, but it's becoming tougher. So framework dominance has now given way to financial dominance, and the Fed's past actions limit its ability to use the interest rate tool to combat inflation, which, after all, is job one. So financial stability has become deeply intertwined with monetary policy, and it's hard to keep them separate. Uh, You can hear it in the talk, say, by my colleague Austin Goolsby, the president of the Chicago Fed. Um, Mark Carney talked about supervision being a way to separate monetary concerns from financial stability concerns. Unfortunately, this doesn't work at the time you need it. 2007, 2008, it didn't work. 2020 didn't work. Remember the massive intervention, of course, uh, in response to a massive shock, but it was liquidity intervention, solvency intervention. And finally, again, in 2023, the measure of, you know, how we have underperformed as central banks is not just the banking failures we've seen so far, but the enormous intervention in providing liquidity, the need for fiscal transfers to banks, and the minimization of haircuts and the guaranteeing of deposits today. So let me end by saying, where do we go from here? What kind of framework should we be thinking of going forward? And I want to refer to a previous speech by my friend and former boss, Augustine Carstens. Not today's speech on trust, but one on the two inflation regimes he gave a, uh, a few months ago. Augustine pointed out to the possibility that we really are uh, uh, you know, in the presence of two possible inflation regimes. Uh, of course, this is a simplification, but it's, it's, it's very valuable to think about it. There's a low inflation regime where price shocks do not feed on each other and become generalized inflation. In fact, it's really hard to get inflation up. And that's why inflation may be too low, below targets. And to get out of this, you need from Krugman's uh, sort of thinking, need a framework that commits the central bank to being patient, even irresponsible in raising interest rates. The other alternative is the high inflation regime where price shocks are much more correlated and become generalized uh, inflation very quickly. Here you need to react quickly to head off generalized inflation. And the old mantra, if you see inflation in the eyeballs, it's too late. In this kind of regime, you need the traditional inflation targeting regime that commits uh, central banks to being proactive against inflation extremely responsible if you want to use the uh, uh, the obverse of the Krugman term. The problem is we may transition between regimes. We talked about potentially uh, long-term, uh, the um, real interest rate coming down once we're done with all this. We don't know, lots of moving parts there. But if it becomes harder to get inflation up once we exit from this, Uh, or in the uh, transition we've already seen from a low inflation regime to a high inflation regime, we may be stuck with the wrong framework if we keep changing frameworks. The framework that is good for a low inflation regime is just horrible for a high inflation regime and vice versa. So the real question is, uh, you know, which kind of framework do we need for all times since we can only choose one? And I would argue, given the financial instability in the transition from the low inflation to the high inflation regime, given that we have uh, particularly few tools, few uh, reliable tools against low inflation, perhaps we should settle for having a constant responsible framework for all regimes. That is, pick the framework that contains high inflation, be ready to fight high inflation quickly. And what happens if you have low inflation? Don't worry about it too much unless it becomes galloping deflation, which I should hasten to note we have yet seen. As Masaiko Shirakawa says, low inflation is not so bad, and he should know he experienced it for a long time. The cure to low inflation, as we now recognize, may be worse than the disease. Put differently, central banks can achieve more by doing less. Let me stop there.
Thank you. Thank you for, the, uh, for all the panelists. Uh, we have questions now, <laughs> questions uh, for the panelists in general. Uh, and you please uh, answer uh, if you think it's, it's proper. Uh, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges for central banks today? First question, please. I start? I start? I start? Yeah. Well, the first thing I have to say to, to Juan Jose is it's super stabilizer because coming from Argentina, anybody who stabilizes <laughs> is super. Okay. I didn't uh, understand that. Anyway, <laughs> so so no, I, I want to follow up on on Ragu, um, Ragu's excellent presentation. I think that the biggest challenge today is complacency. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me get a slightly technical here for a second. If, if you you take a traditional new Keynesian model, the one that we use in central banks. From a mathematical point of view, that system is unstable if the interest rate is fixed. Uh, maybe a way of thinking of, of this in an intuitive way is you have a fixed interest rate and say prices increase and the demand for money increases, that pushes up interest rate and that pushes the central bank to print money, to bring down the interest rate. So it ends up being a passive money which validates the price increases. So this comes from a, the mathematical model. And the way that you break this instability is what's something which is called the Taylor Principle, which is what Raghu was saying, to be proactive, okay? So you see inflation, you, you, you're not going to wait to see if this is transitory, temp, whatever, you just react. So, so, so this is the, the theory says this. Now the problem is that the US and Europe had been so tremendously successful in bringing down inflation for what, 30 years, 40 years? that when inflation came up, they said, well, this can't be happening, or this is transitory, or this is going to go away. I have a friend which sits in the board of the ECB, I'm not going to tell you which person is that, but our models basically say, he says, my model tells me that next year inflation in Europe is going to be 2%, because we have models where inflation is inflation expectations. So they forgot that, you know, if you do a monetary policy, which is very expansionary, well, prices are going to increase and inflation expectations are going to follow, which of course here in Latin America we know and we remember much better. So, uh, and I think that's the reason why if you look at central banks in Latin America, starting with the one in Brazil, have been much more reactive and much more quicker in reacting to the high inflation. So, so I, think, I think the complacency Let's think about this. In the US, core inflation is stuck at five for the last two years. And it has not even moved an inch. If core inflation is fixed. So, so I think this complacency and this idea that this can't be happening to us and that this will go away and that we've already done enough, there's no evidence that we've done enough if the core inflation is stuck up there at more than twice your target. I think in Latin America, the biggest challenge is different. We, Central banks have been more reactive. I think their problem is more about communication, convincing their societies they need to do this. I think that in the in the current situation, I would say those are the two different challenges in different regions. And the main challenge in Colombia is very simple: is to return to three percent inflation. We had twenty-three percent, twenty-five percent inflation for a long time. Now we are in twelve percent, which is very high. For, for the target, compared to the target, it's going to be a difficult job, and we have to do it. Well, thank you. Uh, any, any comment, Mr. Rahm? Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, look, I, I think uh, I agree entirely uh, with Federico that um, complacency is an issue, but I also think that, um, you know, every wave of central bank intervention uh, creates more expectation of more intervention. And so uh, if uh, I were to add to the problems that uh, uh, we have to deal with, it is how do we back off from this escalating uh, sort of sequence of interventions. Now, some of it is more, you know, the issue of moral hazard, but, but some of it is, uh, you know, um, the sense that increasingly central banks uh, will do what it takes to bail out the private sector on any dimension, whether it's liquidity, whether it's solvency and, and central banks. I mean, certainly uh, we've seen in the US that this has happened time and again. Now we're talking about insuring all deposits. So um, how do you break that sequence? 
I think that that to my mind is a, is very important. How do you disengage the central bank for, from intervention on all sorts of areas, which uh, in the past we we thought were really bad? Certainly in emerging markets, government financing was was taboo. We moved away from it, but we moved back in, into it in a big way. How do you stop that? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Rahan. Uh, the conditions, other question, the conditions under which central banks uh, operated uh, have or operate have changed uh, greatly uh, in the last uh, decades. But most central banks' mandates remain unchanged. Uh, in a previous question, having touched on the challenges for the central banks, uh, the question now is, what are the opportunities for central banks and what roles should they embrace in the economic policy mix to address the issuing uh, challenges ahead? Please. I start. Uh, well, I think, I think the mandate of the central bank, yeah, things change, but the mandate and the most important mandate remains the same, which is price stability, which is this idea of the system being healthy, and I think if, if you take Raghu's comment, I mean, we had a, a, a period where there was a risk of deflation and uh, now high inflation, and he's advocating, and I agree completely, that, well, we should settle on one framework. And the framework is to deal with the problem of high inflation, which is the, the, really the, the most serious problem that I think a central bank uh, faces. Of course, I think there are new challenges that will be coming, which have to do with the payment systems, which will have to do with the disappearance of cash, and uh, one day Mercado Libre and Amazon will want to issue their own currencies and uh, central banks will have to <coughs> learn how to deal with that. But if we stick to the topic of this panel, which is uh, monetary policy, I think uh, we should, I, I'm, I'm for the old mandate and to keep it there. We have that mandate, we, f we feel comfortable with that. Um, I will advocate for more competition in the financial system if possible. But as I, as I said, uh, Colombia has been doing well with, the, with inflation targeting and our mandate of low inflation and uh, natural or potential growth, I think it's a good mandate. Dr. Rahan? So, my, my, I mean, I, I uh, would say price stability, of course, but uh, if we have a, an inflation target, uh, I would subtly, and, and I don't know how this would be done, but say the, um, you know, transgressing on the higher side is the more important cost than uh, undershooting the target. So it may be, I mean, you don't want to say this explicitly, but perhaps the asymmetric target, I think it was the ECB which had it, was, was probably um, reasonable. Um, I would also, uh, again, implicitly put some weight on financial stability. Again, I wouldn't sort of mess it up with the monetary framework, but uh, perhaps ensure that the body looking at financial stability has some commonality with the Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, maybe a few governors, as in the Bank of England, uh, maybe the governor uh, sort of chairs both. Uh, but some notion, I mean, in the U.S., uh, as uh, Don Cohn has said on a, a number of occasions, mm -hmm. uh, there is really no body tasked with financial stability for the country as a whole. And uh, if you don't have that, uh, and especially if it has no links with the monetary uh, uh, sort of uh, rate setting committee, then perhaps the, you, you really need a strong form of separation for it to work. And I don't see that having worked over the last so many years. Well, thank you. Uh, the third question is, how do you assess the central bank's autonomy in your country? And do you think that it has been challenged in a way or another during the last years? Please. Federico. <laughs> no, I will start. Okay. <clears throat> no, as, as I was saying, uh, I think we have an independent central bank and and, and thanks to the fact that it was built in the new constitution, it was good for the country. Mm -hmm. So, of course, presidents all, always complain about increasing rates, but I hope they are near 
Mr. Villar knows more than I know, and that the job is done. So in that sense, I, I feel comfortable, and I think the independence, independence is a good thing in Colombia, and people know that. I hope I am right. <laughs> okay. Please. Well, uh, you know I told you that in Argentina, the central bank is not independent. I think the solution is, is, is in the Beatles. You know the Beatles, the Beatles? Okay. So wh wh why do I say this? How do you make a central bank independent in Argentina? So the first thing that you can say is, okay, let's pass a law making the central bank independent. And that certainly will help. But to be honest, I think in Argentina it's not enough. We had a central bank which was independent in the 1990s. We had deflation, okay? And then a government came and say, well, now the central bank is not independent anymore. So not, not enough. So some people say, well, maybe you should dollarize. And uh, I think not enough. Because you dollarize, and then one day the government says, oh, what a temptation, all these dollars here. Now you have to pay your taxes again in pesos, and you de-dollarize, okay? And the government, so not enough, not enough. So, um, so I'm going to say something now that Roberto will not, we already talked about this, and he doesn't, okay, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, it's a free country, okay? <laughs> um, Look, Argentinians, Argentinian government defaults the debt every day. They wake up and say, what can I default today, okay? And don't okay, default every, not the debt. <laughs> but for example, they don't default the IMF. So something in the politician's mind, they kind of have a little bit of uh, pudor. ¿Cómo se dice pudor en inglés? Pudor en inglés, it's kind of... Prudence. Uh, eh? No, you no. kind of feel something, you know, that you don't want to default on the World Bank or the multilateral organization. So I think that if we would have a multilateral central bank, maybe then the politicians in Argentina would respect the, that central bank, okay? It's so I don't know, Roberto, if you, if you can think of something, you know, it's a kind of a central bank of the Mercosur or something. Look, we, we're in, we're in, okay? If you offer, we're in. Because I think it's the only way that, uh, I, mean, I make it a little bit funny, but actually it's a serious point that I'm making here, which is how do you tie up this credibility? And in fact, if you look at Europe, many countries in Europe, then, well, they defer their monetary policy to a common entity, which is the European Central Bank. Um, well, I don't know, maybe Germany had an incentive, maybe Brazil doesn't have the same kind of incentive to do this. Uh, as Germany had in Europe, but uh, certainly from the perspective of us, we would be kind of the Italian or the Greeks, okay, in, in, in this group here, in this bunch here. I think that would uh, work. That's why I'm saying the solution is with the Beatles, because they have a, a song which says, with a little bit help of our friends, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Rara, uh, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we had a multi national central banker, right, who started this off, Mark Carney, uh, Canadian, uh, I, I think he has dual citizenship, but would that be a solution, uh, Federico, to your multinational, rather than have it, have uh, monetary policy across areas, have, have a governor and a board who are not necessarily from the same country? I mean, uh, the UK started on this path. Maybe. Um, I, you know, I, I, I want to agree with you. Maybe it's the fact that we went to, uh, you know, uh, school together uh, many years ago. But this, this idea of, uh, you know, the independence is a very loaded term. Typically, we think of it as term. Uh, your term is protected. But there's so much else that matters, right? Whether you get the board that you want or you have people within the board who are undermining your ability to make policy. Uh, there are other threats that can be imposed, a uh, threat to not elevate central bank salaries, uh, which comes from the fiscal authorities sometimes, uh, the threat to limit your powers. Uh, I think the Fed faces this, you know, you can't, cannot do this, you cannot do that, and you're doing too much, you have to ask Congress. And then mandates, uh, you know, there was, as, as you remember, an uh, 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 attempt to impose the Taylor Rule on the Fed and basically had to get the Fed to explain when it deviated from the Taylor Rule. So um, I think uh, independence is, is, is a constant battle. And uh, some of it comes from trust that, uh, you know, the central bank will do its job, uh, the point that Augustine was making earlier. The problem, of course, is that kind of trust is lost when you need independence the most. 
And, uh, and I think that, that becomes the difficulty that we all have to deal with. When you lose control over inflation, that's when the trust is lost, the, the independence becomes fraught. Let me stop. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have evidently uh, many other questions. Most of you would have uh, several questions, uh, but we have to finish. We have some time constraints. Uh, there is another panel uh, ahead of us, and uh, uh, then I would like to uh, say some uh, last words. One of the uh, questions uh, which uh, were suggested uh, was the balance between uh, monetary and fiscal policy after the pandemic. I thought I, I, I'd like to ask this question not only uh, regarding after the pandemic, but also in, uh, in general, at any time. The minister has uh, made an analogy today of the question of two legs, two, bo sorry, two arms of the same body the monetary and the fiscal policy. I would like to make another analogy, analogy, which is two legs of the same body. And the question here is, it, it's not efficient, it doesn't work if one leg wants to move ahead and the other, legs want, the other leg wants to move backwards uh, for uh, good reason. Uh, the most efficient way if both legs, legs walk to the same direction. Evidently, under the right conditions and doing uh, a policy frame, uh, doing a uh, policy action which uh, address the main question. Uh, in this case, uh, for instance, is the case in the case of Brazil and most of the countries we are seeing now, uh, now after the pandemic, is the question of evidently inflation higher than the target. And I'd like to end uh, addressing one point, one conclusion uh, reached by a very uh, evidently a relevant central bank, which is the Federal Reserve, uh, the board that has in its mandate, which is uh, one of 1913, uh, two main uh, challenges. To me, the mandate is one, to control inflation, the other one to maximize the creation of jobs. In the beginning, there was some contradiction here. Well, to maximize jobs, for instance, even when inflation is higher, you should not raise interest rates. But evidently, the conclusion in due time was the best way to maximize growth and the job creation is to control inflation. Then there is, yes, uh, convergency between the two uh, mandates of the Fed. In the case of Brazil, I think I would say a similar way. We have to control inflation first, uh, then evidently, uh, we, I have already talked about uh, financial stability and countries' financial stability in general. In summary, uh, I think it was a very useful, very uh, interesting panel. I would th thank the panelists in general uh, for facing uh, this challenge. Thank you all, and uh, let's move ahead. Thank you very much. We thank the participants of the session and invite everyone to the coffee break served in the foyer. We will return in 15 minutes. So continuing with the high-level seminar on central banking, past and present challenges for the next session, the session two of this event, post-pandemic challenges, high inflation, high debt, and financial stability, we invite to the stage Mr. Roberto Campos Neto, Governor of the Banco Central do Brasil, who will serve as the moderator of this panel. And we invite to the stage also the panelists. Mr. Julio Julio Velarde, Governor of the Banco Central de Reserva del Peru.
Julio Velarde has been governor of the Central Reserve Bank of Peru since October 2006. In his capacity, he was named the Center, Central Banker of the Year for the Americas in 2022 and Global Center Banker of the Year in 2015 by the Financial Times, the banker. Mr. Leonardo Villar, Governor of the Banco de la República in Colombia. Leonardo Villar is the current governor of the Colombia Central Bank since January 2021. Previously, uh, he was executive director at the International Monetary Fund for Spain, Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, and four Central American countries, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Salvador, and Honduras. Mr. Pablo Hernandez de Cos, governor of the Banco de España. He is member of the Governing and General Council of the European Central Bank, chair of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, uh, and also of the Board of the Governors of the Center for Latin American Monetary Studies, and also chair of the Advisory Technical Committee for of the European Systemic Risk Board. Ms. Rosana, Rosana Costa, Governor of the Banco Central de Chile, <clears throat> who is joining us virtually. Rosana Costa was appointed governor of the Central Bank of Chile in February 2002-2022 and board member of the Central Bank of Chile in January 2017. At the same time of her appointment to the board, she had been serving as Deputy Director of the Liberty and Development Institute since June to, uh, 2014 and was also on the board of the National Productivity Commission and the Advisory Commission of Technical Education. Mr. Tiff McLean, Governor of the Bank of Canada, also join us virtually. Mr. McLean was appointed Governor of the Bank of Canada in June 2020 for a seven-year term. Mr. McLean first joined the Bank of Canada in 1984 and held various senior positions, including Chief of Research and Advisor to the Governor. He was appointed a Deputy Governor in 2004 and Senior Deputy Governor in 2010. Ms. Christine Lagarde, President of the European Central Bank, could not attend this event but sent a video with her remarks. Uh, since November 2019, Christine Lagarde has been the President of the European Central Bank between 2011 and 2019. She served as the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Prior to that, she served as French Economic Finance Minister from 2007 to 2011, after having been Trade Secretary from 2005 to 2007. So, as I already told you, uh, she unfortunately could not attend this event, but kindly, gently sent a video with her remarks. Let's watch this video. Dear Roberto, dear colleagues on the panel, it is a pleasure to contribute to this important panel discussion, even if I have not had the good fortune of being able to be there in person. What I would like to touch on in my remarks is how central banks should approach the relationship between price stability and financial stability. For many central banks, including the ECB, our primary mandate is price stability. And after a series of unprecedented shocks, the pandemic, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, unacceptable, the energy crisis, we have faced surging inflation. Last year, average annual inflation in the OECD doubled to 9.6%, its highest level since the 80s. This has led central banks worldwide to adjust course rapidly, tightening monetary policy at a pace not seen in decades. Brazil was one of the first. 
At the ECB, we have raised interest rates by 375 basis points in just 10 months, our fastest pace ever. However, these adjustments have taken place after a long period of extremely accommodative monetary policy to fight to low inflation. And such periods of low interest rates can lead to maturity mismatches and excessive interest rate risks, which are then exposed when rates rise and losses have to be booked. Recent events have also demonstrated how potential vulnerabilities can quickly transform into runs in an increasingly digital era. Rumors can circulate on social media with ease, and customers can move bank deposits at the touch of a screen. All this means that deposits may no longer be considered as sticky as they were once. In this context, central banks, supervisors and regulators need to be forward-looking and highly attentive to such vulnerabilities as, and mismatches, in particular by conducting regular stress testing and risk assessment and requiring fast and satisfactory remediation of any weaknesses that supervisors identify. But for monetary policy, while remaining alert to the broader implications of policy adjustment, there are at least three good reasons why ensuring price stability remains essential and should not be compromised. First, while financial instability is currently a potential risk, too high inflation is a reality. To relax the fight against inflation in order to head off possible risks to the financial sector would be inconsistent with our mandate. Worse still, it would amount to financial dominance and lead to a loss of trust in the central bank, which itself can induce financial instability. Second, central banks' policy toolkits have evolved considerably since the great financial crisis. We can set the appropriate policy stance to control inflation and at the same time use other instruments to address risks to financial stability. In the case of the ECB, we have traditionally deployed a toolkit that includes longer-term refinancing operation and asset purchases programs, both of which can be used, if needed, to safeguard monetary transmission. Third, the Basel Committee agreed a whole series of regulatory reforms after the great financial crisis, precisely to reduce the riskiness of the banking sector and mitigate policy trade-offs. And where the, these reforms have been applied consistently, they are proving, so far, to work well. In Europe, for example, we have applied the Basel III rules to all relevant EU banks. That is, over 2,000 European banks in total. The aggregated common equity tier 1 ratio currently stands at a solid 15.3%. And Europe's banking sector also benefits from aggregate liquidity coverage and net stable funding ratios that are way above their minimum, at 61 and 26 percentage points, respectively. All this has allowed the EU banking sector to weather contagion from other jurisdictions to date. Of course, regulators and supervisors need to remain extra vigilant to financial sector risks. We are not out of the woods yet, but for all the reasons I have mentioned, we should not trade off price stability and financial stability. We can successfully pursue both goals at the same time. And one is a precondition for the other, as the ECB has put forward clearly in its recent strategy review. The ECB will do what is necessary to deliver price stability, meaning the timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term target. Thank you for your patience.
So now I give the floor to the moderator of this uh, session, Mr. Roberto Campos Neto, please. Hello, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone uh, for being here, for participating. Um, I wanna say thanks to all the central bankers, all the ex-central bankers, all the people from the market, a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, this is the first time that the central bank does an event like that. I'm very glad that you all came, and I think uh, we can uh, have very interesting debates. I actually had uh, a pre, uh, uh, like a, a small uh, speech in the beginning, but you heard from me a lot, and we are running a little bit late, and I think it's much more interesting to hear from the, the panelists, and I can do a wrap-up at the end. So um, I will start with uh, Julio Velarde, the president of the Central Bank of Peru. Um, I always say that Julio is a bit of a hero for us because he's been there since 2007. Uh, you have all the turmoil that happens in the country, and sometimes I get worried, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I talk to Julio and I say, Julio, are you okay? He says, no, everything is fine. And the president is changing, and you read the things in the news, and you look at the markets in Peru, and, and the volatility is not that high, it's very low. So I think it's an example for Brazil of what an independent central bank can do. So with that, uh, I'll give the, the floor to Julio. Thanks a lot, Julio. Thank you, Roberto. It's a pleasure to be here. Probably your interaction will have been more interesting than what I'm going to say. Um, as was mentioned, after a long period of low inflation, the great moderation of the 90s, and after Lehman, people get used to low inflation, particularly in developed countries, the States and Europe, uh, and I believe that was certain, and some complacency. And probably it took a little longer for the central banks to react. Maybe for a time even they were sitting on their hands, waiting, <laughs> expecting that inflation will correct itself, that it was just a supply shock that might be reversed. Um, <clears throat> but having had a, such a long period of low inflation has some advantages. Not a complacency I was talking about, but as you have seen, for example, the presentation of Juan Jose Chavarria, inflation expectation remains well anchored. You see two, three years, they remain pretty well. 20 years ago, that would not been the case. So, of course, in our case, for example, we have the highest inflation since 1997, the longest period outside inflation targeting since we adopted inflation target in the, in the year 2000, and also the highest, higher inflation expectations since inflation targeting. But in spite of that, still two, three years, inflation expectations are pretty low compared to previous periods. And probably that is a consequence of having more than 20 years of very low inflation. In our case, inflation has been the lowest in the region, outside, of course, those countries that have the dollar as their currency. No? Um, also, we have had this long period of rate of interest, particularly since 2007, one year before Lehman, uh, even more after Lehman. And also, probably, there has been some complacency. In this case, in market participants, the younger traders do not remember that period when interest rates were 4 or 5%. Juan Jose was seeing that when he was governor, he was reducing the rate always, not increasing them. So probably you have these mismatches. It's not a surprise that the investing portfolios believing that big hikes will never happen. It's not a surprise thing like Silicon Valley, where they believe that interest rate will be so so low for long so long that they were buying long term paper without assuming the risk they were taking. It was like in the old bankers, this phrase, borrow short and lend long. Of course, that worked in the 60s, in the time of the three Martin Lange, when you had an interest rate caps in, in, the, in the States, or Revolution Q, where always you were assured that the interest rate that you borrow would be low for long. That is not the case anymore. But there was this belief in the markets that this situation that lasted for almost 15 years would have been uh, maintained. Um, 
Now, one of the concerns that many people are uh, having is that inflation will remain high for, for long. I, I believe that almost everybody that has seen history knows that if we keep our monetary instruments so as to reduce inflation, inflation is going to come down. It is coming more slowly than most of us were expecting. It might take longer to reach the target, but it will get there. The problem, since it is taking more time than what we were assuming, at some time maybe there will be voices so as to reduce prematurely that position. Uh, Federico mentioned that his case is trying to reduce the interest rate and not, uh, because of demand for people that were complaining that the rate was hurting them and was affecting the economy. And that has been the case in many countries. If you remember the pressure from the government of the Fed, uh, Lyndon Johnson pushing uh, Chesney McMartin. Chesney McMartin has been the longest serving governor of the Fed, even longer than, than Greenspan. He pushed him to the wall. Lyndon Johnson was a big man. Why, why our boys are dying in Vietnam? You try to, to increase the interest rate, something like that, no? And Burns was attacked by Nixon. Burns also reduced the interest rate, and he didn't get growth, and he only got more inflation. And even uh, Volcker was pressured, but not so much. And you see recently uh, Trump, in his last two years, pressuring Powell very strongly, attacking him almost every week. Uh, so these pressures are going to remain always. But what has been said by some of the previous speakers is that you are not going to get more growth. You are only going to get more inflation. And that is the big problem. It reminds us from the phrase of Churchill talking about, green, uh, about Chamberlain. You are not going to get peace, <laughs> something like that. No? And it happens, happens a lot of times. And the recent case, Federico mentioned one of his in his country, Erdogan, you can say, uh, yeah, you have so many cases where you had tried to reduce the interest rate and you have had even bigger inflation. In the case of Volcker, I talk about Volcker, he reduced at first the interest rate and he had more inflation. At the end, he had to raise the interest rate. At the end, he had more inflation and higher interest rate, higher cost of taking debt. In the region, the problems that we have had more, and it's still in the case of Argentina, for example, have been fiscal dominance. The inability to preserve the autonomy of the central bank because of the pressures, the fiscal pressure of the government. And that has been the story of Latin America for a long time. Not so, not, not so important now in many countries, but it has been the story in the, in the first place. And last year, we celebrated 100 years of the Central Bank of Peru, and I was reading some of the old books, and there was one guy in the 1940s he was not a very professional, probably. But every young man that tried to enter the central bank, he would try to explain to, to the young man what the job of the central banker was. And he took the young boy to a, to a box full of money. And then, this, our job is to keep this box almost full of money. The government will try to put his can in the box, but you should try to have the government to take as little as possible. And that's the secret of the central bank. <laughs> uh, and actually, fiscal dominance has been very important. But uh, in many cases, it was something like I was saying of this old banker of the 1940s. Um, there was pressure to finance the government, but it was not so strong. You had these cycles of stop going cycles. You pushed the economy for a time, it grew. And at one time, it was unsustainable to keep the chain rate you had to value. That was with Bread of Woods. Spain had it also, Italy. It was common during the years of Bread of Woods. Uh, in Colombia, I remember Yeras, every time he devalued one president of the Colombia in the 60s. He was going to reason to the country, something like that. It was very strange. But, but, but it was typical. You try to push the economy. You had a problem. The problem is sometimes it might work like Italy, it's not work, but the damage was not so big. But countries, at first, it was just a little bit inflation, it could be even. 
a two-digit inflation like the 20s and 30s that Colombia had, but then it could become worse if the situation worsens. Um, yes, maybe to, so we have to resist, resist these pressures. They are going to be there all the time. I want to, because of some mentions, how we adopt inflation targeting and history. And something about intervention that mentioned also Juan Jose. Well, we adopted inflation target in the year 2000, 2001 exactly, after negative inflation. So it was pretty different from the case of other countries, uh, Colombia, Spain, for example, even Brazil, out of inflation target to reduce inflation year by year. In our case, it was to increase inflation. And not to increase inflation, to have monetary uh, expansionary monetary policy without affecting expectations. Uh, Kuroda did something similar in 2014 in Japan, but it was uh, something opposite. And probably since we started with negative inflation, inflation targeting, it can be explained why also we have the lowest inflation in the region, because it, it was pretty different, the, the mechanism. Uh, and that part, uh, we started in 1990 stabilization, we float in the chain rate. But of course, you have to intervene. We, you have negative reserves. When you have had, as maybe it would be the case in Argentina, you have to correct a lot of prices. The real stock of money is going to come down. You have to increase money supply. And if you don't have reserves, probably the best way is to buy dollars. And that is an intervention at the end, particularly in those cases. No? And one of the things we have learned during the years of hyperinflation or distortion in prices it has been that Having a chain rate that is too appreciated leads to a lot of problems. In, in, in our case specifically, something like you are not going to have growth reducing the rate was our case of inflation. We had inflation because the government didn't want inflation. Since they wanted the price of gas to increase, they subsidized it. Since they want to get into rate, a low rate of interest in the state banks, they subsidized it through the central bank. Since they didn't want to increase the price of wheat, corn, or whatever, they put a special dollar for those imports. But at the end, they have to pay more for the exporters, otherwise they will get down the drain. So at the end, they had to print more money because they didn't want the prices to increase, and at the end, they had even a bigger increase of prices. No? Um, and I, well, I will just finish saying that probably what we have learned is that autonomy of the central bank is indispensable. There will always be pressures. It can be good intention pressures. It might be that the government might be more optimistic, the price of oil is going to go up, the price of copper is going to go up, or whatever. So things will solve itself. We're using a temporary financing. Things will solve by themselves at the end. Or you will have pressures because they are facing elections. What you, uh, what you had in one of the kind of governments of the country now, <laughs> uh, if you have, for example, run elections two years after you have been elected, there's a lot of pressure of uh, delayed reforms so as to maintain their parliamentary representation. Well, with this, thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Julio. Uh, now we uh, go to uh, Governor Leonardo Villar from Colombia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, will, I want to, to, to start by expressing my gratitude to Banco Central do Brasil uh, for this invitation. Um, Banco de la República, the, the Central Bank of Colombia, is celebrating this year, the 100th anniversary. Our central bank was founded in 1923, just one year after the Central Bank of Peru and two years before the Central Bank of Chile. These three banks were created following the recommendations of the same North, North American advisor, Edwin Kemeter. That explains why, in all three cases, financial supervision was assigned to a different institution other than the central bank. In this context, before talking about the more recent performance of the Colombian economy, 
I would like to start my intervention presenting some key issues in the Colombian economic history that may be common not only to Chile and Peru, but also to other countries in the region. The first issue is about autonomy. The central banks were created as institutions with private sector boards and as such independent from the government. However, they had very strict rules tied to the gold standard that, that inhibited any autonomous monetary policy. In Colombia, the degree of discretion of the central bank regarding monetary policy was increased in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And in the 1950s and 60s, the direction of monetary, the direction of monetary policy was shifted from the private sector towards uh, to, 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 to the, to private, from the private sector board towards a governmental institution and the bank's goal were expanded, turning it in practice into a development bank. Money issuance became determined by the financial needs of the government as well as those of specific private groups that were beneficiaries of the development funds created within the central bank. The impact of this process was a significant increase in inflation, which was high and volatile during the 1960s and remained high for the next 25 years, also relatively stable around 20, 25%, which are low figures compared to those of other countries in Latin America in the 70s and the 80s. In this, in this context, Banco de la República obtained its autonomy in 1991 with the Constitutional Assembly that followed a peace agreement between the government and the M19 guerrilla movement, the one in which the current Colombian president had participated in the 1970s and 1980s. Among many other changes, the Constitution granted the Colombian Central Bank its autonomy with a seven-member board, which includes, besides the Minister of Finance, the, with a um, five full-time independent members who are appointed for fixed terms in such a way as to guarantee that only a minority is chosen by the government in power. The seventh member is the governor of the central bank who, as mentioned by Juan Jose Chavarria, is appointed by the board and not by the government. Even more importantly, the 1991 constitution established that the central bank, that the central bank's main goal was to maintain price stability while coordinating with the government and seeking to achieve the highest possible sustainable growth. I bring this history here to highlight the highly important consensus reached among very different social actors in the Constitutional Assembly that the Central Bank of Colombia was to be autonomous and that its primary objective was to maintain price stability. The second bit of history that I would like to bring up in my intervention has to do with the fact that in my country the exchange rate was used as a policy instrument during the 20th century. This was a common practice in most countries of the region and in many more emerging economies. Indeed, the exchange rate served as an, as an anchor in the process of price determination and the central bank tried to keep it within a predetermined path which could be the gold standard, a uh, fixed exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar, or a predetermined path of currency depreciation through a, a crawling peg. Only as recently as the last decade of the 20th century, Colombia started a process of gradual liberalization of the exchange rate, initially with the exchange rate bonds, and later on, since 1999, with a floating regime in which the central bank does not intervene in the FX market, except on very specific situations in which intervention is required to mitigate extreme volatility or liquidity shortages, or to bring foreign reserves towards their optimal level. In an economy like Colombia, subject to important exogenous swings of international capital flows and with an export basket with a strong uh, weight of uh, commodities with uh, volatile prices, the strategy of using the exchange rate as a policy tool 
implied that monetary policy typically acted in a pro-cyclical way, reinforcing the booms and the busts originated in external conditions. Indeed, when foreign conditions deteriorated, the central bank had to sell its FX reserves, thus restricting domestic liquidity in pesos and reinforcing the busts. Likewise, whenever there was a boom in the terms of trade or in foreign capital inflows, the central bank had to buy FX reserves to avoid an appreciation of the peso, thus increasing domestic liquidity and reinforcing the boom. A very important change in monetary policy took place at the beginning of the current century, the adoption of the FX floating regime, which allowed the exchange rate to be the first line of defense against external swings and shocks, and most, most importantly, provided monetary policy with sufficient leeway to act in a counter-cyclical way, relaxing whenever demand was below the potential output of the economy and tightening when demand was above potential and upward pressures on inflation were present. Of course, the exchange rate floating regime implied that it could not continue being the anchor for price determination. A new anchor was badly needed and inflation targeting came to be a very appropriate instrument for this purpose. Inflation expectations and credibility in the inflation target set by the central bank are now key to keeping inflation under control. They also allow the central bank to undertake counter-cyclical monetary policies and to contribute to sustainable GDP and employment growth. Leaving aside my historical considerations, let me now switch to some comments on the more recent experience in Colombia with the post-pandemic inflation increase that has affected all of our countries. In Colombia, inflation has been more stubborn than in most other countries. During the first quarter of 2023, it stabilized around 13.3%, the highest rate in the last 25 years. Only last month, in April, we saw a reduction in the yearly inflation rate to 12.8%, which we expect to be a definitive turning point after more than two years of an increasing trend. Upward in pressure, inflation pressures in Colombia during the last two years can be explained mainly by persistent supply shocks, particularly in the food sector, and by excess aggregate demand. The persistence of such high inflation in 2023, in turn, is associated to the, the depreciation of the peso and to strong indexation mechanisms. Food inflation was remark remarkably high in Colombia in both 21 and 22. Besides global pressures on international food prices and a significant depreciation of the Colombian peso, which reinforced those pressures, we experienced specific supply shocks, including unusually rainy weather, and agricultural production declined, while GDP in other sectors grew by more than 7%. At, in this context, the increase in food prices was 28% in 2022, despite the fact that they had increased quite substantially already in 2021. Altogether, the increase in food prices was higher than 50% during the last two years, more than 30 percentage points above the CPI increase in that period. Since January 2023, the yearly rate of food price inflation has shown a decreasing trend, although it is still very high, standing at 18.5% last April. We expect this normalization process to continue during the rest of this year and in, 19 and, and in 2024. The reduction in food price inflation will allow headline inflation to decrease. However, however non-food inflation is likely to, re, to remain um, sticky and to continue eventually rising throughout the current quarter before beginning to decline in the second half of the year. We have tightened tightened monetary policy quite drastically, increasing the monetary policy interest rate by 11.5 percentage points during the last 19 months. As mentioned by Juan Jose Chavarria, that's, that is much more than twice what any the advanced economy has done. 
We have publicly said that the monetary policy stance is already contractionary, but we cannot yet assure, assure that the tightening cycle is over. Although there are many signs that aggregate demand is declining and that the economy is adjusting in the required direction. We expect inflation to decline during the rest of 2023 and the following year so we can return to our 3% target at, by the end of 2024. Independent analysts' expectations are broadly consistent with a convergence of inflation to the target, even if they consider such convergence as being somewhat slower. In any case, it is clear that there is great uncertainty in the process and that the very long period in which we expect to miss the inflation target, including the last two years, is implying an important cost to its credibility. The stickiness of non-food and core inflation can be explained by three main factors. The output gap, or the excess demand to call in, in other terms, is still pos positive. Accumulated pressures from a depreciating exchange rate and indexation mechanism. Regarding the output gap, it is important to highlight that the Colombian economy recovered very rapidly from the pandemic with GDP growth rates of 11% in 21 and 7.3% in 2022. The re this recovery has led, was led by a very strong dynamism of demand, partly explained by a fiscal deficit that even in 2022 remained above 5.5% of GDP. The current level of GDP is well, well above the one that we would have observed in the absence of the pandemic crisis if growth had continued during the last four years at the potential estimated back then. Excess demand is also reflected in a significant current account deficit in the balance of payments, which reached 6.2% of GDP in 2022. Monetary policy tightening and a reduction in the fiscal deficit forecasted for 2023 are adjusting aggregate demand. The current account deficit is already shrinking while economic activity is losing momentum. Indeed, GDP growth for 2023 is expected to be only 1% with a sharp deceleration vis-a-vis -vis the 7.3% I already mentioned of last year. However, the output gap is still deemed positive and the impact on prices of the reduction in excess demand is only taking place gradually and with an important lag. The second argument to, to explain the stickiness of non-food inflation at high levels in the, Colombian, in, the, in the Colombian case is the accumulated currency depreciation. The depreciation of the Colombian peso during the last two years was one of the highest among Latin, Amer Latin American countries and went hand in hand with the deterioration of investors' country risk perception when fiscal deficits were much larger than those of our regional peers. Although the Colombian peso had, has appreciated during the last few months against the US dollar, it is still depreciating vis-a-vis -vis our peers in the region and high volatility is still present, probably associated with the uncertainty generated by some economic reforms announced by the government. Regarding indexation mechanisms, it is important to point out that the role of inflation target as an, effect, as an effective anchor has been affected by the very long period in which we are expected to miss such target. The increase in the minimum wage well above headline inflation, both in 2022 and in 2023, has added pressures on costs. Besides the wage price dynamics, indexation has also a very important role in Colombia, in Colombia in setting housing rentals, public utility fees, and prices for very significant groups of services, such as, as education, which are adjusted basis, based on past inflation. An additional note has to do with the behavior of, of domestic fuel prices. During 2021 and most of 22, the previous government decided to freeze domestic fuel prices with the purpose of mitigating the inflationary impact of the increase in the international prices and the currency depreciation. However, this decision had a huge fiscal cost that became clearly unsustainable and has led to the need of large monthly hikes in domestic prices in the last six months, which are expected to continue for the rest of 2023. 
Paradoxically, this is happening when foreign, price, foreign fuel prices are going down and the peso is appreciating. The attempt at controlling key prices to mitigate inflationary pressures in the past has led to a situation in which it is now forced to adjust them and thus create additional pressures to head on headline inflation. All of these mechanisms has, have led to inflation inertia, making the central bank work more complex and the disinflationary process more lengthy and costly, implying higher interest rates for longer. It is important to, st to stress, however, that these high interest rates are addressed to guarantee lower inflation, which will in turn will help, which will in turn help to, gr to grow more and uh, paradoxically have lower interest rates in a, sustain in a sustainable way in the medium and long run. I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor Leonardo. Um, we will extend into Latin America and then we go to Spain. Uh, so we'll change a little bit here. Uh, so I, I will um, call now Rosana Costa, the governor uh, from the Central Bank of Chile. Thank you, Rosana, for being here with us today. I think now, you're okay. I want to begin thanking you, Roberto, for the audience who is hearing us. Uh, for this opportunity to share with the um, views of these post-pandemic challenges and to participate with such distinguished colleagues and friends. Unfortunately, I couldn't join you and all of you in person uh, due to scheduling issues. In particular, we are preparing the stability, financial stability report. Uh, so uh, a, 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 my salute to all of you. Before continuing, let me explain that we are in a blackout period yeah, at the Central Bank of Chile prior to the publication of this uh, financial stability report. So my speech, I will refer only to the first part, which is challenges, pre-pandemic, after pre-pandemic challenges in inflation and not in inflation financial stability. The Central Bank of Chile has existed for almost 100 years. In fact, in 2025, we will celebrate our first centenary. Uh, but it was only in 1989 that it was granted constitutional autonomy with a precise mandate to ensure the stability of the currency and the normal functioning of internal and external payments. Since then, more than 30 years have passed and an inflation targeting scheme has been consolidated. Early on in 1991, annual inflation targets began to be set when it had not yet been leveled in that way. As inflation was contro con controlled, leaving behind a long history of high and volatile inflation and even hyperinflation, credibility was gained and the new institutional framework was consolidated. At the same time, the idea of having exchange rate target was abandoned, which at certain moment has faced us with the dilemma of choosing between conflicting goals. Thus, the central bank now reserves the option to intervene in the forex market in exceptional circumstances if it considers that the proper functioning of the financial market is at risk. In 2021, the inflation targeting schemes was strengthened with the adoption of the current two-year annual target of 3% under a flexible exchange rate regime. Meanwhile, there is an orderly fiscal policy and the development of the financial industry has deepened capital market and strengthened the credit channel. This has allowed the consolidation of macroeconomic institution and an average inflation rate close to 3% from 2001 when the current framework began 
until before the pandemic. Along with the technical aspect of macroeconomic analysis, forecasting and modeling, communication, transparency, and accountability have also been improved during all these years to maintain public confidence and credibility in monetary policy and in the institution itself. Um, the autonomy of the central bank has been essential to achieve our objectives and to gain and retain credibility. Our institutional framework considers coordination rules with the government through the Ministry of Finance. These, in general terms, prevent monetary policy from being under fiscal or financial subordination. The fiscal policy is in order, guided by a slightly adjusted balance rule, uh, so that the level of public spending is a predictable antecedent in our decision making. Besides, we are constitutionally pro prohibited from financing the state. Regarding the financial market, we have been working with the authorities to strengthen and deepen the capital market and to ensure adequate regulation and supervision of the system. Experts in the field, the political world and citizens in general agree on the relevance of the central bank's autonomy. Currently, the country is undergoing a process of changing the constitution, both in the constitutional proposal rejected in the plebiscite of September 4 in 2022, and on the basis agreed upon the new constitutional process, the autonomy of the central bank has been preserved. However, in the most recent period, we faced the challenge of high inflation. In April, CPI inflation reached 9.9 annual after a peak of 14.1% in August 2022, and core inflation, that is without volatile prices, stood at 10.3% annual after nine months of being between 10% and 11%. So, Chile faced uh, global and local shocks requiring a particular analysis amid a global inflationary scenario. In Chile, along with the global shocks that affected many economies, there were also relevant domestic elements that merit a uh, throughout examination. In October tw uh, 2019, there was a social outburst that, among other things, raised idiosyncratic uncertainty levels significantly. This was reflected in a significant depreciation of the Chilean peso, unexplained by fundamentals, and an increase in long-term interest rate. As a result, the central bank was forced to implement extraordinary measures to ensure liquidity in pesos and dollars. While the effects of social outbursts were still internalized, the COVID-19 pandemic arrived. From that, that moment until now, the economy has experienced successive and unusual strong and lengthy supply and demand shocks, both internal and external, which have impacted inflation in different ways and with a cumulative impact greater than each of them separately. To deal with the pandemic in March 2020, the monetary policy rate was reduced to its technical minimum of 0.5%. And we implemented measures to provide liquidity to the system, increasing the size of our balance sheet, but ensuring that credit continued to flow to businesses. One of these measures was the establishment of the financial facility conditional and increased lending, which was coordinated with state credit guarantees and more regulatory measures of the Financial Market Committee. This allowed credit to increase, reacting counter-cyclically for the first time, unlike in, pre, unlike, uh, in previous crisis. 
In July 2020, a 10% withdrawal of private pension funds was approved by the Congress. Two more withdrawals followed in December 2020, 2021. During this period, the economy was already reopening and in an evident stage of recovery. Besides these, there were also relevant fiscal transfers, especially in 2021. Stimulus measures to households and firms added up to about 30% of GDP and drove significant macroeconomic imbalances. Under this scenario, in July 2021, the central bank began a fairly aggressive rate hike process. After Brazil, Chile was the second country in the region to do so. While the consequences of the social outbreak, the COVID-19 pandemic and internal imbalance were still present, several additional shocks impacted our economy during 2022. The Russia's invasion of Ukraine drop up international commodity prices, especially energy and food, of which Chile is a net importer. As a result, inflation accelerated amid terms of trade worsening. At the same time, the long duration of the zero COVID policy in China delayed global value change to recovery and put downward pressures on copper price prices, our main export product, among other commodity prices. Contrary to what we expected in a scenario of an increase in the monetary policy rate, the nominal exchange rate depreciated sharply by 19.3% from March to July of that year. Most of the depreciation was idiosyncratic, associated with greater uncertainty and local risk with a higher pass-through resulting in yet larger inflationary pressures on an already overheated economy. In this context, annual inflation figures not seen in almost three decades led to a historic increase in two-year inflation expectations. The need to eliminate macroeconomic imbalances led the central bank to raise the monetary policy rates successively until it reached 11.25% in October 2022. The assessment was that this level was sufficiently contractionary and that it could be maintained for as long as necessary to ensure the convergence of inflation to the target. As of today, the monetary policy rate remains at this level. Fiscal spending also helped contain inflation, which de and decreasing by 23% in real terms in 2022. This prevented monetary policy from being tightened even further. Moreover, the, the finance ministry has strengthened the fiscal framework, adding a debt ceiling and setting a significant reduction in the structural deficit for the coming years, reinforcing its commitment to an orderly and sustainable post-crisis fiscal policy. These decisions have also contributed to reducing levels of uncertainty. Nevertheless, the adjustment of the economy is underway and it still needs to be completed. During uh, this quarter, the output gap will narrow again and will be in negative territory during the second half of 2023 and all of 2024. The current account will move from a deficit of 9% of GDP in 2022 to around 4% of GDP by the end of 2024. Since the end of last year, inflation figures have begun to decline. Uncertainty levels have moderated. The exchange rate has appreciated almost 16% between October 2022 and April 2023 
and private agents have started to adjust their expectation downwards. One of our main expectation surveys, the survey of economic expectation already places the expected two-year inflation at the 3% target for three consecutive months. However, other surveys and market prices still place two-year inflation expectation above the target. Currently, inflation remains the most important problem for households, which currently is more than three times above the target, providing to be a stubbornly pers persistent. The core inflation has remained high and stable for several months, given our unusual combination of shocks. It raises questions regarding their causes and duration, which we have been exploring in depth. In addition, indexation and second round factors were incorporated in our models early in March 2022 and revised in September of the same year. Recently, private consumption was revised upwards for 2020 to 2022, while it has adjusted at a slower pace than expected on the fourth quarter of 2022 and the first of this year. Our most recent research using firms' microdata have shown at least two elements that moderate the lower inflation process. First, the recent appreciation of the exchange rate, which is likely the outcome of a significant reduction in local uncertainty, is expected to slow at the slower path through than in the case of a depreciation, although after a year it is the same. Second, markups understood as the ratio between the price and the marginal cost of variable inputs fell sharply at the beginning of the pandemic. But even with their recent recovery in line with the reversal of intermediate input costs, they are still below their trend, reducing the path through of lower cost to prices. We project a convergence of inflation to 3% by the end of 2024 and a quarter later for core inflation. Given this process has not yet been consolidated, it is still necessary to maintain the monetary policy rate at the current level. We will undoubtedly remain flexible and attentive to the evolution of the macroeconomic and to the extent that said convergence consolidates. The external scenario in terms of financial stability and global inflation present risk and challenges for the Chilean economy and regional economic policy. The international financial situation is constrained thanks to a rapid and coordinated reaction of monetary authorities, but the effect on credit will impact growth in advanced economies. Another focus of attention in this, uh, in the divergence between the future path of the monetary policy rate communicated by the Federal Reserve and ma market expectation. To be prepared for risk scenarios, it is time to rebuild our buffers as soon as possible. Adequate policy coordination is more relevant than ever. Short efforts to contain inflation, help the economic adjustment and reduce its cost particularly in countries like ours, where the effects of demand shocks are still very present and inflation levels remain high, policy actions to curb this imbalance are essential for a more efficient adjustment. Thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move to the uh, for um, Governor uh, Pablo Hernández Cos from the Central Bank of Spain, also the Chairman of the Basel Committee. Thank, thanks a lot, Pablo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto, and uh, thank you to all the staff of the Central Bank of Brazil, Fernanda, for the for the invitation and for the organization of uh, of this um, of this conference. Um, so let me uh, try to concentrate in my in my initial remarks. Uh, on what I consider um, two uh, key attributes 
for uh, effective and uh, sustainable economic policies aimed to, to cope with the macroeconomic challenges posed uh, by the post-pandemic environment. And to a certain extent, I think my, my comments um, will complement uh, the comments of, of previous uh, speakers. So the first point uh, I would like to, to make is that um, to emphasize the, the need uh, for domestic economic policies in general uh, to be framed within a culture of stability. Um, and here I will focus, of course, just uh, for a second, because I think uh, all, all the focus has been put for very good reasons on, on monetary policy, but I think we, we need also to talk also a bit uh, on, on fiscal and on structural reforms as a complement of this culture of uh, uh, stability. Uh, and then second, and with my hat of um, Basel Committee Chair, I will also mm, like to emphasize the need for uh, international cooperation and uh, the alignment of uh, domestic uh, financial policies um, with uh, these uh, international agreements, uh, the international standards. Um, the, uh, and a second element that we would like to focus is not only this uh, full alignment of domestic uh, financial policies with the international standards, but also that uh, in the international domain, we need to respond quickly to the new challenges that the financial landscape, an evolving financial uh, landscape, is always posing to, to us. And I will put uh, two examples here. Uh, one is crypto, okay, and I think the, the Basel Committee already delivered on, on that domain. And the second is, of course, the, the, the banking turmoil that we are uh, experiencing now, and I think we need also to deliver on, on, on that in the, following, in the following months. So, um, starting with the first point, uh, in a recent speech, uh, I have warned against the silence call for a, a dash uh, for growth. Um, and I was focusing my speech uh, uh, in, the, in this risk for a dash for growth in the context of the global financial regulatory cycle. But indeed, I think also that the temptation for a dash for growth can be applied more in general to other economic policies uh, and of course, we know that if uh, this route is followed, the results typically uh, are unsustainable uh, growth patterns and policies that end up fooling the next uh, uh, crisis. So the alternative, and I would say the, the optimal uh, way uh, to, to avoid this, uh, this situation is to embed economic uh, policy making in a culture of stability that can effectively deliver sustained uh, growth. Um, in practical terms, uh, and this was very much emphasized by, um, by uh, Federico, among, among others, uh, um, in the first panel, uh, in practical terms, a culture of stability implies the development and implementation of institutional and practical arrangements that are set, uh, set up to guarantee sustainable policies. And, of course, this is pretty obvious in the monetary policy domain because we, we always talk about the independence of central banks. I think we need to extend this concept not only to uh, central banks but also to supervisory authorities, by the way, banking supervisory authorities. Uh, and I think even this is a concept that uh, can be extended to economic uh, regulatory authorities more, uh, more in general. Uh, so, uh, as this is commonly uh, said, uh, institutions uh, matter. Well, the arguments in favour of independent central banks that were very clearly expressed by, by Federico this, uh, in the first uh, session, um, perhaps let me only add one thing, uh, although it was implicit also in, in his remarks, um, formal or legal independence is not enough. Uh, it has to uh, effectively translate into practical autonomy is what uh, I think you were uh, calling also that the staff should, uh, should be the right one, the rules uh, that uh, you, you defined should also be the, the right ones. Um, so in, uh, independence to, to be effective must rest on a, on a robust legal and institutional framework. Independence must be formally recognized in all of its relevant dimensions, naming, uh, namely at the institutional, but also at the functional, at the personal and even at the financial uh, levels. No? These are uh, absolutely uh, crucial uh, to all of, of us. I mean, the, the novelty that I wanted to introduce uh, now is that this culture of stability should uh, encompass all the domains of economic policy making, including, by the way, fiscal policies. Uh, and uh, the notion that uh, other economic policies should uh, complement monetary policy and also contribute 
to this uh, economic uh, stability is, uh, of course, not, uh, uh, not novel. Uh, in fact, uh, as an example in the European context, the design of the European Economic and Monetary Union always had this in mind uh, since uh, its inception. And as such, from the start, uh, the treaty, the Maastricht Treaty, uh, which uh, all the convergence criteria that were uh, defined there uh, went uh, always went be, from the very beginning beyond inflation uh, to also include uh, targets in terms of fiscal discipline and it's uh, continuing to be so on an ongoing basis on the so-called stability and growth uh, pact which is the rule that is governing the fiscal policies of uh, uh, European Monetary uh, Union. And by the way, it was uh, during the global financial crisis, uh, and in particular during the sovereign uh, debt crisis, the European sovereign debt crisis, it was uh, even added a new layer to this uh, uh, stability and growth path, which is the macro imbalance uh, procedure. Uh, and this later check uh, what, uh, was put in the focus on structural reforms and on productivity, um, uh, and broad macroeconomic uh, policies, and this was the response to the hard lessons learned, and in particular in countries like Spain, by the way, uh, that uh, a lack of competitiveness and excessive credit cycles could uh, seriously hamper the optimal conduct of monetary policy uh, and could also result in fr financial fragmentation within the European uh, Monetary uh, Union. So, uh, in other words, uh, I think an important lesson not to be forgotten is that, of course, central bank credibility is an essential element for the effectiveness of monetary policy, but monetary policy is more efficient when coupled uh, with and uh, complemented by uh, an appropriate balance in overall uh, economic uh, policy uh, making. Um, in other words, in order not to overburden uh, policy, monetary policy, it is essential to achieve a, a balanced uh, policy mix, uh, and such mix uh, should include long-term growth enhancing fiscal policies that ensure their sustainability and sufficient structural reforms that increase uh, productivity. Uh, by the way, this has, in my view, uh, a practical conclusion for the current context. And uh, it's obvious that in the very high inflation episode that we are experiencing, it's crucial that monetary policies focus in guaranteeing a timely return to our medium-term targets with decisive actions. And I think my uh, own opinion for the euro area is that we've done a, a significant part of the job, uh, but uh, not all of the job. And there is uh, still uh, some job uh, that, uh, to be done. Uh, but in parallel, I think it's important to stress that uh, in this high current uh, inflation um, setting, an appropriate uh, policy mix requires a fiscal stance that is not at odds um, with the tightening of our monetary policy. And this is uh, why, from the central banking community, we are emphasizing that the government support measures um, during the, 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 the energy crisis should be temporarily targeted and tailored to preserving incentives to consume less energy, and they should also be gradually rolled uh, back as energy prices fall. Otherwise, uh, we are at risk of driving up medium-term inflationary uh, pressures, which could call for a stronger uh, monetary uh, policy uh, response. So this is the, the first uh, point that I wanted to make. Uh, let me now move to the second point, which is this idea that in particular for financial stability, uh, we need international uh, cooperation. International uh, cooperation is key that uh, domestic uh, financial policy should be completely aligned to uh, these uh, international agreements and that uh, at the same time these international agreements should be flexible enough to respond to the new challenges that uh, um, this uh, uh, adaptive uh, um, financial lang uh, landscape is posing to, to us. So I think it's uh, obvious that recent events, including, of course, the global pandemic, the geopolitical developments more recently, uh, um, have reminded us of the need for international collaboration. And this is particularly true when it comes uh, to safeguarding global financial stability. Um, I think it's uh, obvious in this room that uh, to say that financial stability is a global public good, the cross-border spillovers of financial distress can result in an underinvestment in financial stability by individual jurisdictions. So an open global financial system requires global prudential standards. And of course, to achieve uh, global financial stability, uh, this requires a minimum set of global standards. And failure to provide uh, such minimum global standards results in regulatory fragmentation, regulatory arbitrage, and an uneven playing field for international active uh, banks. So this is precisely the objective that the, the Basel Committee um, is, is, is having when trying to deal with, uh, with the banking uh, regulation. 
Uh, and by the way, I think that our track record of effective and close cooperation reflect a deep and well-founded commitment by all our commi uh, uh, all, all jurisdictions, all, all our members, including, by the way, the Central Bank of Brazil, which joined the committee, the Basel Committee, during the global financial crisis in 2009, and it's been a, a very important pillar of the work of the Basel Committee during all these uh, years. So the, the point I wanted to, to emphasize uh, re regarding to the work of international community on, 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 on financial regulation and in particular on banking regulation is that we need to respond to the new challenges. And let me put these two examples that I was um, um, emphasizing at the beginning. First is crypto. Um, so I think it's uh, fair to say that uh, after two uh, crypto winters and countless episodes of crypto distress, there is a broad agreement that crypto markets present a number of financial stability risk uh, and the recent banking turmoil uh, has not fundamentally changed this assessment and riskiness of most crypto assets. We also know that uh, crypto markets are fast evolving markets and have the scale to grow rapidly and that the channels of direct and indirect interconnections with the banking system are highly opaque. So the combination of a relatively mature uh, market on the one hand with a highly leveraged and fractionally reserved banking system may raise financial stability risk. And this is why the Basel Committee three years ago started the, a, a, a deep work and have actively uh, been actively cooperating in pursuing a forward-looking approach to its work on crypto assets. And this led at the end of uh, last uh, year, and I can uh, uh, speak here also in name of, uh, of Tiff uh, Macklin, which is uh, the chair of our uh, GHOS, uh, um, uh, who was in the end who, the, 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 the global body who put a stamp on this uh, standard. We finalized and published a global standard at the end of last year that specifies the prudential treatment for banks exposure for crypto assets. And for me, this is an example of how the global community can respond quickly to the new challenges that this global financial language spec is always uh, 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 pursuing. The second example um, is related to the recent marking uh, turmoil. So I, I, I should say that, uh, at least in my view, the recent events are perhaps the first real stress test for the banking system since the global financial crisis because uh, banks were largely buttressed by significant public support measures during the pandemic. You know? So to a certain extent, all the measures that were applied by the monetary policy authorities or by the public uh, authorities in the end isolated the banking sector for the, uh, the, for the consequences of the, of the, of the pandemic. So um, the BASIC committee is now leading a global stock take of these developments and the supervisory regulatory implications of this with a view, of course, uh, to learning lessons. The stock take has started, so, uh, uh, so I will not, I, can, I cannot prejudge the outcome of it, but let me make at least uh, three broad points at this, uh, at this stage. The first one is that banks should be the first port of call in managing and overseeing risks. Um, jumping straight to discussions about the regulatory and supervisory implications of recent events is akin to forgiving banks for their primary responsibilities and likewise for shareholders and investors for not exercising due diligence. In practice, a common threat across bank failures, both recently and historically, has been poor risk management and governance practices by banks. And I think this is important to be uh, remembered. Second, uh, recent events have also reminded us of the critical importance of effective supervision and robust regulatory standards. The Basel III reforms have greatly enhanced the resilience of the global banking system, with the total leverage halving since 2011 and liquidity asset holdings doubling. These reforms uh, help contain the fallout of uh, the recent stress events. And, uh, of course, uh, the focus that we have to put is uh, we need to, to continue pu uh, putting the focus on is on the implementation of the Basel reforms, including those that are still uh, pending. And then, finally, I think we need also, uh, we need also to be humble and open-minded when it comes to assessing the implication of recent events. While not jumping to conclusions, we should be prepared to take whatever actions are needed to safeguard global financial uh, stability, if we want at least to serve uh, our, our citizens, as uh, with, I think we've been doing till now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pablo. Uh, Chief, thanks for hanging there late afternoon in Canada. Thank you so much. So now we turn to uh, Chief Macklin, the governor, uh, the central bank governor of Canada. Thanks a lot, Chief. 
Well, Roberto, thank, th thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, thanks to you and your team to making it, making it possible to do this virtually. I, I wish I could be with you all in person. Uh, at the Bank for International Settlements, I, I, I regularly have the privilege of sitting between Roberto and Rosanna, thanks to the alphabetical order of our countries, Brazil, Canada, Chile. And, and it is a real honor uh, to be part of this distinguished panel to discuss the challenges ahead. The recent declaration by the World Health Organization that the pandemic uh, emergency is over is a reminder to us all what we've been through. But a little more than three years since the pandemic has hit us all, there are new challenges. High inflation, high indebtedness, and the risk of financial instability. Central banks, as you've heard, in all our countries have a shared determination to restore price stability while maintaining uh, financial stability. But as we have each raised our policy rates, we've seen similar stresses and strains. The pain that higher borrowing costs bring to highly indebted households and the tremors through the financial sector as lenders and investors adjust to a higher interest rate environment. Importantly, we also see that inflation is coming down. Monetary policy is working. As we work to address the biggest challenge we're all facing, which is high inflation, we are confronted with the other two. The ripple effects that come from fighting inflation that are felt both by the people we serve and by the financial system that connects us all. We're seeing this internationally. We're also seeing this domestically. And what I thought I could do in my comments is, is, is say a few words about each of these. So let me start with inflation. High inflation, how we got here, is, it's, is much discussed and debated, but really there's not that much mystery. The pandemic brought on again, off again shutdowns to the global economy. It brought dramatic shifts in the goods and services that people wanted to buy. And uh, there have been a myriad of hurdles for producers to actually produce and supply those goods and services. All of this combined with Russia's horrific aggression in Ukraine constricted global supply chains and brought sharply higher goods price inflation. Next came higher serv service price inflation as our economies reopened rapidly. Households wanted to catch up on the in-person services that they'd missed, but businesses couldn't keep up and prices rose sharply. All around the world, policymakers have had much the same response to high inflation. Central bankers have raised interest rates rapidly and repeatedly to dampen demand and let's give supply the opportunity to catch up. And Banco de Brazil, Roberto, has been among the leaders raising rates early and forcefully. And my most important first message is it's working. Our economies are rebalancing and inflation is coming down. After eight consecutive interest rate increases in Canada, inflation has come down from a peak of just over 8% to about 4.5% now. Uh, we have paused our interest rate increases. Uh, the last increase was last January. And we're using this pause to assess whether we have increased our policy rates enough to get inflation back to 2%. And as I tell markets repeatedly, it is far too early to be thinking about interest rate cuts. We expect uh, inflation, CPI inflation to decline to around 3% this summer. And then the next leg from three to two uh, is gonna take longer. And I'd have to admit it is more uncertain. We, we think we'll get back to the 2% target um, around the end of 2024. I'd also stress what, that with inflation still well above our target, we are more worried about the upside risks to inflation. So while inflation is coming down, uh, I think what we're all feeling is that it hasn't been easy. Uh, interest rate increases have strained the budgets of households uh, and they are, they're feeling the pain. They're feeling the pain of higher interest rates uh, and they've been enduring the pain of higher inflation. And you know, there's a couple of questions I, I'm getting pretty regularly. The first is, why do we need to be so aggressive about raising interest rates to combat inflation? 
And the other question I'm often getting is, do we really need to get inflation all the way back to the 2% target? As others have stressed, history gives us the answer. All our countries have experienced high inflation, and we've all studied it, we've modeled it, we've analyzed it. And every time you look at it, what you see is that the longer inflation remains high and the higher it is, the harder it is for everyone to plan their spending and savings. Inflation erodes the value of money. It distorts and confuses the information and incentives that consumers, businesses, entrepreneurs, and savers and investors rely on to make economic decision. And above all, it feeds frustration among our citizens. It, it creates social tensions and it creates a, a, a feeling of unfairness. What makes inflation so difficult is that the solution, higher interest rates and slower growth, is painful too. And as we raise interest rates, the Bank of Canada has become part of the news cycle. It's, we're regularly discussed in Parliament and, and we're now frequently debated in public discourse. I've been getting a lot more letters, a lot more requests for interviews from a much broader uh, range of news outlets. And I think I speak for most central bankers when I say we did not get into this business uh, to get our pictures in the paper. Uh, the unofficial motto of our communications department at the Bank of Canada is make the Bank of Canada boring again. When central banking is interesting, that's when our independence is tested. Nobody likes high inflation. Nobody likes the solution either. Central bank independence is always important, but it becomes more important when the decisions are difficult, and they're difficult now. Canadians tell us consistently through surveys, focus groups, and other consultations, they want their central bank to be independent of commercial or political influence and to act clearly in their best interests. Central, bank, central banks provide public benefits like low inflation, financial stability, and secure forms of payment. And they should not be influenced by commercial interests. And with respect to political influence, governments have many public policy priorities, security, health, education, jobs, industry, trade. Sometimes these pursuits can come into conflict with the central bank's core mandate of, ins of ensuring low and stable inflation. As of others have, have argued, it's important that we really try to minimize these conflicts. Uh, and one way we deal with them is the independence of the central bank. Trust is often tested in a crisis. And there's no question central banks have been tested by the unpredictability brought on by the pandemic. We believe we earn the trust of Canadians by clearly explaining ourselves and by following through on our commitments. And we know that the better the Canadians understand our goals, the more likely we are to achieve them. Public trust is fundamental to our ability to deliver on our mandate. Tough questions, added scrutiny, and informed debate are entirely appropriate in the current environment. We welcome them as an opportunity to engage with Canadians about what we do, how we do it, and how we can get better at doing it. So my colleagues and I are speaking more often to more diverse audiences, and we're taking every opportunity we, we have to explain the actions we're taking. And we're doing more listening too. We've increased outreach to business leaders and financial markets. Yes, those are the, you know, those are our, uh, you know, our audiences we speak to, have spoken to regularly, but we are broadening to indigenous groups, labor, civil society organizations, academics, researchers, and private sector economists, and yeah, everyday Canadians, through a range of surveys and outreach activities. What we're hearing from people brings me to my next challenge, high indebtedness, and in particular, high household indebtedness. By increasing the policy rate, we are slowing consumer demand, allowing supply to catch up. But higher borrowing costs are interacting with higher household indebtedness, and that is squeezing some consumers. High levels of debt become riskier in a rising interest rate environment. And as we said this week in our financial system review, we are now more concerned about the ability of households to service their debt given increasing the increase in borrowing costs. In Canada, we have both variable and fixed rate mortgages. The typical 
fixed rate mortgage has a term of five years. So well, as we've raised rates, what's happened is people with variable rates, uh, variable rate mortgages are already feeling very immediately the higher costs of higher interest rates. Uh, for those on fixed, uh, fixed mortgages, as they're renewing their mortgages, they are feeling the impact. And looking ahead, we know that there are, um, over the next two, three years, uh, Canadians will be renewing their mortgages at significantly higher rates, and that is going to put uh, additional financial pressure on them. Declining price, house prices, uh, house prices went up very rapidly through the pandemic. They've now come down about 15%. And so for those people who bought at the peak, they've also seen um, a material decline in home equity. Uh, that can also put some stress on borrowers. Uh, the good news is that so far Canadians are proving uh, resilient. Uh, Canadians have a, a long history of paying their mortgages uh, and so far, delinquencies remain low. But were there to be a severe recession in the country, um, there could certainly be uh, more stress. We're not forecasting a recession. Our base case projection is for a few quarters of slower but positive growth. Uh, but um, there are risks out there. And there's more than one way that a severe recession could occur. But uh, one way is if if there was um, a financial, if there was a lot of global financial stress, uh, and if that happens, that'll put pressure on our banks, uh, and they could cut lending. So that really brings me to the third challenge, uh, which is financial instability. The biggest downside risk to our inflation forecast is a severe global recession. As I said. That's not something we're projecting, um, but uh, there are risks out there. And one way that could happen is if there was a period of severe global financial stress. Now, financial instability, um, it, it, could be, it could be an amplifier or it could even be a trigger of a, of a sharper slowdown. And re recent banking stress in the United States and Switzerland has been a reminder that financial instability can strike quickly. Fortunately, authorities in both those countries took swift and forceful actions to protect depositors, maintain confidence, and keep credit flowing. And that combined with the safeguards that uh, Pablo was talking about, uh, the, the development and implementation of Basel III uh, since the global financial crisis have made financial institutions and the overall system much more resilient uh, together with the, the actions taken by the U.S. And, and Swiss, that has really limited financial contagion. But there are risks out there. Um, in Canada, the spillover effects from the recent incidents uh, in the U.S. And, and Switzerland have been very muted. Uh, and I think that really reflects the fact that um, our, our system has a number of strengths. Uh, all our banks are subject to, to Basel III. Uh, I think it reflects the structure of our banking system, uh, together with strong risk management in our financial institutions. But you know, I, I do want to conclude by saying a few words you know, about how we think about monetary policy and uh, financial stability. And in this regard, um, I, I will my remarks will will sound a, a lot like uh, what Christine started us off with. And the first point here is that it's not one or the other. We need both price stability and financial stability. Price stability, confidence in the value of money, is the foundation of a stable and well-functioning financial system. And financial stability is a precondition for price stability. And to, 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 put, it, to put it more bluntly, the uncertainty that comes with high inflation or a lack of price stability is not going to improve financial stability. And severe financial stress is only going to make achieving price stability more complicated. The second point is that we have separate mandates and separate tools for price stability and financial stability. So we can work to achieve both at the same time. Our primary tool, uh, our primary monetary policy tool uh, that we are using to bring demand and supply into balance and get inflation back to target is our policy interest rate. 
And in the event of severe stress in the financial system, we have a range of tools we can use to provide liquidity against good collateral and keep credit flowing. The third point, though, is that price stability and financial stability can interact, and we do have to take that into account. Financial stress will generally have implications for the calibration of monetary policy. And financial, when financial stress tightens uh, financial conditions, that means that loans become more expensive uh, and harder to get. Now, in the current environment, we've been tightening monetary policy. That has been tightening financial conditions. That's the intended consequence of increasing interest rates. But if there was a more pervasive uh, if there was more pervasive financial stress in the system, that could lead to more tightening than we'd expected. And if that was to persist, that's something that we would have to take into consideration as we set monetary policy to achieve our target. At the same time, the financial system needs to adjust to higher interest rates. Uh, interest rates are not are very unlikely to go back to the lows that we've seen over the last decade. This underscores the importance of sound risk management in financial institutions and vigilant supervision to identify and manage the risks as the economy slows and the costs of funding adjust to higher interest rates. So let me conclude. The adjustment to higher interest rates hasn't been easy, but the alternative, continued high inflation, is worse. Price stability is foundational to our shared prosperity. The economy works better when inflation is low, stable, and predictable, and it's better for workers, businesses, and governments alike. Price stability protects households from the anxiety created by large changes in the cost of living, and it means households and businesses can budget and save with confidence. That's the destination. We're on this path together to bring inflation down, and I look forward to uh, further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Chief. Thanks everybody for hanging there on a on a Friday afternoon. I I, I will try to be fun from now. Um, so one of one of the questions that we debate a lot in the BIS amongst the central bankers, and actually it was a question that I was going to ask John, but he couldn't be here today was uh, regarding the neutral rates. Uh, in the case of the central bank in Brazil, we have upgraded um, neutral rates from three to four. Today, John made some statements that he thinks that neutral rates are in change in the US and that we're gonna go back to an environment of low rates uh, very soon after the pandemic. Uh, but I think this is highly controversial. So the question uh, for you, and I'll probably start with Chief, and then uh, anybody else who uh, wants to answer is, um, how do you see this uh, uncertainty uh, regarding uh, possible changes in uh, neutral rate and how that affects the framework in which you are working today? So we can start with Chief. Uh, well, Roberto, it's a real shame John's not here because he he he, he loves our star, uh, and uh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, look, you know, I, I think we all have to admit there's a lot of uncertainty about our star. Um, we we uh, recently, so once a year at the Bank of Canada, we update our estimates for both potential output and our star, uh, or the neutral rate of interest. Um, and when we put it through the analysis. We, we've got various different models that we use, and you know they're, they're you know the factors are the things you'd expect, things like demographics, things like the levels of government debt, and when you when you put put uh, the data we have through the models we have, um, there we we don't find compelling evidence that the neutral rate of interest has changed, and interestingly, uh, the WIO came out. Um, almost the same time as our own analysis, and, and they they do their analysis is very similar. They looked at it on a global basis, pretty similar models, uh, and actually came to the same conclusion, which may, maybe that's somewhat reassuring. Um, but I, I'd say two things. Um, I don't speak for the whole governing council, but I think at a personal level, it seems more likely that it's 
a little higher than we think, then it's lower than our estimates. Um, even if we, you know, the, the data, the, our analysis suggests it hasn't, we can't find clear evidence that it's changed, um, but it seems unlikely that it's going to be a lot lower than our estimates. Maybe it's a bit higher. The other thing I would say is one of the, one of the, I think, benefits of the inflation targeting framework is that it's actually fairly well designed to deal with gradual things that change. I mean, we have a number of unobserved variables, the neutral rate, potential output. And as long as changes in those things are reasonably gradual, and you'd certainly think that any change in the neutral rate would be pretty gradual, the, the, the you know, the, the framework is reasonably well designed to handle that. So, you know, if, if our star turns out to be a little bit higher than, or it turns out to be higher than what we think it is, that means monetary policy is not as restrictive as we think it is. And that means inflation is not going to come uh, down to our target. Uh, it's not going to get all the way down to the target. So, you know, so if that happens, I mean, over time, we'll see, you know, inflation has been coming down, but we'll see, well, it's, you know, it's starting to come, it's not coming down as fast as our, our forecast. It's starting to come in higher and we will naturally adjust. We'll, you know, we'll either leave rates higher for longer or we'll increase rates uh, to get it down. So while it is a fundamental uncertainty, and it would be great if we could get better estimates, I, I do think our framework uh, can handle handle it as long as it isn't changing rapidly. Okay. Pablo, maybe you can talk about Europe a little bit. No, well, I, I think I fully agree with uh, what uh, Tiff uh, has said, no? when uh, our staff uh, provide us uh, with um, new um, results, no? empirical evidence on, on the estimates of uh, our star, um, it's true that uh, it's not obvious um, that um, you can say that it has increased. But perhaps it's uh, more interesting, at least in, in real time, to, to think about the, the, the arguments no? that uh, we were using um, before the pandemic uh, to justify that our star was very low and, well, to analyze to what extent uh, this ha has changed or not. No? And there, there are at least two, two arguments that are still there, um, probably because they are very uh, slow moving. Uh, I don't think they have changed. I think it was Mark uh, in the first panel who, who was making the, 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 the same point. Demographics is one, inequality is the, is the other. Um, there are other two uh, arguments that perhaps uh, could lead to the conclusion that our star could be uh, a, a, bit, a bit higher, uh, with, of course, a, a lot of uncertainty. The first one um, is productivity. So one of the, uh, the arguments that we were using to justify uh, our, our star to be very low is that uh, this uh, negative uh, trend on, on productivity. Well, one could think that uh, all this uh, emphasis on digitalization uh, artificial intelligence, etc. This should, at, at some point, lead to, to higher productivity of our economies, even if we are not observing this in the in the data. But that's uh, one one possibility. And the other, perhaps, for me, more more important argument in order to justify uh, at least a slightly uh, higher star is um, the high uh, the higher level of uh, public debt that we have in in, in in our in our economies. That 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 for me would be the the most uh, the most relevant argument of, of all in order to justify at least. Uh, higher uh, level of our start than before the before the, the pandemic. Whether this is uh, relevant in terms of uh, practical policy making, I have uh, serious doubts. Uh, in particular, in the case of the of the euro area and the European Central Bank, we are using only these estimates uh, at the end of the process. So you have um, a projection for inflation uh, that is based on uh, a certain path of interest rates. That they can, you can judge whether the path is sufficient or not in order to reach uh, your target. And then at some point, uh, when you've decided on uh, what the level of interest rate you want, you can compare it with uh, a start in order to, to communicate whether you, you see that um, the, the level of rates uh, that you want in order to, what you need to, you know, to, to, to meet the target uh, is uh, in restrictive or, or territory or, or, or not. But it's more a communication device that uh, an, an analytical, let's say, element of the, of the, of the foundations of our, of our decisions. Julio Leonardo. Uh, we have kept our interest rate uh, neutral 1.5, but all the arguments are the same that have been mentioned. We cannot see it, it's unobservable. That experience will tell you you are right. And we might be right or wrong by not such a big number. Uh, not such a big number. So probably just the years will tell you that you have missed that target in 25 basis points, whatever, no? Mm -hmm. But the arguments are more or less the same, no? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I tend to agree with what Paolo said that uh, this is especially a communication problem and also a practical problem in the models. It's a, it's a modeling problem because we need these non observable, observable variables to, to work with the models. But uh, my feeling is that at the end, we have to wait and see what happens in reality to see if, uh, if these variables really changed. In practice, what we have done is... In now, can you speak closer? Okay. Sorry. In, in practice, what we have done in the case of Colombia is to increase the, 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 the neutral rate mm -hmm. that we use in the models. Uh, and the main reason for that is... You the, have increased in the... the yeah, the we have increased okay. it quite substantially, mainly because of the risk perception about mm -hmm. the country. But... Uh, but it's just uh, one element of the of the modeling because we also have many ch possible changes in potential output, which is also an unobservable observable variable that we, we we cannot measure strictly and we which can be changed can be uh, affected by changes in productivity by changes in in demographics, especially because of immigration to Colombia. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we don't know in which direction. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. One other question is: um, Remember our meetings in in the BIS? We used we used to be surprised in our countries on different things, and all of a sudden everything became in a sink. We we kind of have uh, the same surprises, and we see some of the same effects, even though it differs from country to country a little bit. One of the things that we have been surprised, even, even after hiking rates a lot, is that the numbers from the economy seem to be very resilient, especially in the labor part. But overall, when you look at the index of surprises in the economy, it keeps uh, you know, beating the expectation in most places. So the question is, why do you think that is? Um, is there anything related to the monetary policy channel or the power of the monetary policy channel, why do you think we are getting surprised by the data in terms of better performance on the macroeconomic front? I believe inertia is more important than what people tend to believe many times. You, know? you saw it in Brexit, for example. That it took longer for the effects of Brexit to be felt. And it's not so surprising if you are used to a growth, let us say, of 4%, investor consumers, everybody will expect that growth. So they will be acting in function of that. And that is basically inertia. So it, these effects take longer than what we will expect just by the models. No? So do you think that the, the, the gap um, is a bit longer than it used to be, or is just the inertia is working in different ways? No, for, for example, uh, what we have seen now is when we saw the amount of savings in the last half of 2020, in almost every country, I saw the number from France, from Peru, etc., were exceptionally high. In our case, it was the, the highest number since 1990. Those savings have been employed later. Mm -hmm. So actually, that has given some impulse to okay. continue spending consumption. No? Okay. Pablo? Well, when we analyze uh, this um, resilience no, of uh, the euro area economy, also the Spanish economy uh, is, 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 is real. Um, I mean, we, we were uh, forecasting um, almost a recession no, for the euro area mm -hmm. uh, some uh, quarters ago, and in the end, this has not happened. For me, there are at least three, three arguments and three elements behind, uh, behind this resilience. The first one is perhaps the most obvious one, is that... Uh, at least part of the supply, the negative supply shocks that were hitting the economy, they have reversed. Mm -hmm. So we have to take into account that, for example, gas prices in, in, in the euro area are, mm -hmm. are today at a lower level than before mm -hmm. the, 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 the war in, in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we've also seen that um, 
all the all the problems with the supply uh, uh, the supply chains, the world supply chain tra chains in, 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 in trade, they have also uh, been resolved in a, in a relatively quick uh, quick manner. Right? This is the, the, the different indicators are showing this, and probably probably in a quicker manner than we were initially expecting. This is a first point. Second is fiscal. So the fiscal impulse in, in the euro area, uh, also in the Spanish economy, has been very significant. Mm -hmm. So 2% of GDP for the euro area as a whole uh, was uh, uh, the, the, impulse, the fiscal impulse in 2022, mm -hmm. and it's also expected 2% uh, in 2023. So to a certain extent, this is um, um, safeguarding no? the, the real incomes of, um, of uh, households and, 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 and firms, and of course it's playing a role also in providing more resilience to, to the common economy. And I think this, is, this impulse was also, is, is being also higher than initially expected by, by, by ASK. And then the, sec the third element probably is uh, the buffers. Mm -hmm. That probably we minimize um, at the beginning of the of the of the in particular of the war in Ukraine uh, that um, the buffers in particular that uh, households have accumulated they they are there they are real and they are buffering you not know, the consumption to to certain to certain extent so for example for the Spanish economy the all the forced saving that the Spanish households accumulated during the pandemic um, were of a magnitude of between six and seven percent of GDP. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it was not at all immaterial. It was a very significant uh, number. It is true that it was very much uh, focus, focus and concentrated on rich people, and this means that uh, with a lower propensity for consume, to, to consume. But of course, it was also relatively significant for uh, for for the for the middle class. And I think this has also, and we have some evidence that it has also played a role in in, in providing a buffer to to consumption. Chief, in the case of Canada, um, well, I. I I share a lot of uh, Pablo's views. Uh, you know, as you start out the question, I mean, what is so interesting is that we're all pretty much all uh, been surprised by the resilience of our economies, um, and I, I would largely agree with with, with Pablo. Um, you know, there are some global common factors: supply, you know, supply chains resolved. Uh, there's also, I think, a lot of pent-up demand on, on, the, on the part of households for services that they couldn't consume. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even, you know, it's really, the economy's pretty much been open for a year now, but, you know, people are still catching up, particularly on, on vacations, on, on tourism. Um, and even if you've raised interest rates, I mean, yeah, it's more expensive, everything's more expensive, but damn it, I haven't had a holiday in three years and I'm going anyways. Um, so there, there is a certain pent-up demand there. Um, the, with respect to whether the lag in monetary policy is working, um, I mean, that's a difficult question, but certainly at least in Canada, you know, we are seeing very directly the effects of higher interest rates on interest rate sensitive sectors. I mean, the housing market has contracted uh, very rapidly. House prices are actually down about 15% uh, from their peak. Um, if you look at, at uh, household durables, furniture, appliances, things people often buy on credit, um, you know, there you're seeing uh, much slower spending and inflation in, in household durables has come down considerably. Where you're not seeing, where we haven't seen it really turn yet is in services. And there's a couple of reasons why you'd think services would take longer. One, as I mentioned, you know, services didn't boom until the economy reopened and there's still some pent up demand for services. And secondly, monetary policy takes longer to work on services. You don't, you, hopefully you don't go to the restaurant on credit. Um, it's, it's only once you've renewed your mortgage that you, know, you find you have less money left over after you've paid your mortgage. And so maybe you cut back on some of those services. So that is something that we're really watching very closely. And we, we're going to have to, you know, to get inflation back to target, we've got to see it. We are seeing goods price inflation come down quite a bit. Uh, what we're not seeing yet really is service price inflation come down. And so that is something that we are watching very closely. You're probably going to need to see wage growth come down. Um, you need to see some easing in the labor market. Uh, to get the service price inflation down to target. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question, uh, and it is uh, regarding the climate change and the effect on what we do. And um, it's amazing because uh, we look at the fact that inflation in Brazil was rising before most places, and a lot of it was related to weather. Federico talked about Argentina, and we saw what happened 
with the drought in Argentina. You had an example from the past, and we had it again now. And a lot of people are saying some of the places we are going to have more re recurrent uh, effects uh, from the climate. So the question is, how do you think we should factor that in uh, in our in our policy uh, in our policy reaction? Well, we'll have more volatility. For the first time this year, in about 80 years, we have a cyclone in Peru. It happens once every century. And we are having more of this phenomena continuously. And they can be in different directions. They can be drought or excessive rains. So probably you will have a greater volatility in prices, mm -hmm. particularly in emerging markets where food mm -hmm. has a greater weight in the CPI. You know? mm -hmm. So we have to accept that volatility. Probably you have a target of plus minus 1.5. Mm -hmm. So probably you will move more with, uh, we hope, within the target. You know? Okay. Pablo? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think that the most evident uh, impact is actually what, um, uh, what um, Julio said, no, is volatility. Probably we should also expect higher inflation. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's true uh, that uh, initially when we were considering these issues at the ECB, we were thinking more, not so much about the, about the physical risk of climate change, we were thinking more about the, the transition risk in that defined as the reaction of governments precisely to fight against climate change, which in, among other things might require higher uh, uh, environmental taxation, and this could create no, some, some spillovers to, 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 to inflation. The, re the reality is that uh, it seems that, um, according to, to, to recent events, that uh, also the, um, the physical risk might, might be relevant in order, in order to push uh, some, uh, some, some inflation, uh, uh, in particular in some items, no? food inflation in, in particular, but uh, probably in other items as, as, as well. Tiff, any comment on that? Um, well, I'll just add one comment. Yes, I, I agree with Julio. I think the, the most direct effect is, is more volatility. Um, the, the one I would add, though, is um, I, one, one thing we've experienced in Canada, and may, maybe some of you have experienced, you know, it, I mean, before we had climate change, we've always had weather events, and we've always had some harvests are better than others, and, and you know, there have been floods, there have been droughts before. Um, and, you know, typically these these shocks, while they're, they're damaging at the time, they, they aren't terribly persistent. They do create volatility, but the reality is from a monetary policy perspective, we, we, we largely see weather as temporary, and so we just look through it. But some of these um, more extreme weather events are actually uh, damaging core infrastructure, and as a result, they're having longer impacts. So, for example, we had some devastating floods in Western Canada, and they took out roads and bridges that were key transportation links. And so, you know, even when the weather got better, they still, you know, the the effects, uh, out, you know, lasted a lot longer than the bad weather. Uh, it's taken a long time to repair those roads and bridges. Uh, another example in Canada is we're getting uh, much larger and more extreme forest fires, and they can burn down, uh, you know, they can burn down whole towns, they can take out uh, infrastructure uh, that takes a long time to repair. So unfortunately, it's not, it, it, some of these effects could be, there's more volatility, but there are also maybe supply shocks that are going to last longer. Okay, thank you. So um, I was always told the moderator shouldn't speak uh, too much. So we're coming to the end. I had so many, I tried, to, um, I tried to write down most of the comments from, from everybody. It's going to be very hard to summarize everything right now. Um, but I just wanted to you know, raise a couple of points. Uh, the first one is we're seeing higher rates everywhere. And regardless whether you, you know, you're still um, below, uh, you still have a, a you know, negative real rate, uh, but we have, we have gone a long way. And one of the things that I think we have a very high degree of uncertainty is the effect of that on credit. Um, and I was trying to look at the credit data for many different places. If you look at US, for example, you have a deceleration in credit from 9% growth to zero. Um, in Europe, we, I was talking to Pablo, we were talking at the BIS the other day, it seems like you have a deceleration of something like between eight and nine also to zero. In a country like Brazil, where you raise rates from 2 to 13.75, we are seeing a deceleration from 13 
uh, from uh, 13 and a half to something like between seven and eight, which is not a lot. Um, and I think there was a high uncertainty to that. When you look at the fact that you can map more or less 60% of the credit, and you're seeing a sharp deceleration on that, and you still see data coming out positive, and when you look at, for example, what the IMF used uh, in the forecast, which was a 2% drop in the credit, in the growth of credit, seems to be, seems to be a disconnection. There seems to be a disconnection between what we see in credit and what we're expecting in growth. And that could be for many reasons. One of which, which was uh, mentioned today, which is that we are having higher and higher non-bank financial intermediation, but that's only relevant in a couple of places. But I would first point out that there is a disconnection between credit growth and the expectations for growth, and the reaction of credit to the policy is more uncertain than before. The second part is uh, we are having this very uh, constant uh, surprise on the upside, like we said in, in most of the data, in most of the data for the, for the macro environment, labor is being resilient in most places. Um, when you look at service prices, service prices uh, it's higher than we expect in most places. Um, a lot of people now are talking about there is something in the behavior. So people want more experience and less goods, which means that you're going to have uh, you're going to buy less goods, but you're going to have more experience. So services will tend to compensate for that. And I think that remains to be seen, whether it's a change of behavior or not. But the fact is that inflation uh, in services is very sticky. And I think that explains in part what we see in the labor market. Also, the core numbers are very high. And I think Federico mentioned the core number in Brazil is very high. And in most places are very high. Um, and the deceleration is very slow. And I remember many debates that we had in the BIS in which initially uh, we had the idea that this would be in two phases. First, we thought it was going to be linear. Then we started to see, no, this is going to be in two phases because it's going to be easy to decelerate the price of food and energy. And then because the dissemination has gone to, uh, to an extent, uh, the second part of it will be stickier. But then the question is, at what level this is going to stall? Is that 3%, like Chief said, for a target of 2 or 1? Or is it going to be at a higher level? Because that, I think, has an implication in what's the, the policy that, that, that we will have. And I think there's going to be an intense talk on the trade-off between what is the economic cost to bring inflation lower from that stalling point. Um, the other, the other, um, the other conclusions are, I think, the, the obvious conclusions. The inflation target has served us well, and we need to persevere uh, on the inflation. We need to make sure that uh, we bring inflation back to the target. On the financial stability, I think um, we talked a lot about that, but I think, and using the expression that Agustin used a lot, I think to some extent the genie is out of the bottle because you have many different things that were there in the past, but now I think they're playing uh, together in a more decisive way. One is the lower, uh, the cost of transferring money, the marginal cost of transferring money is going to zero. The second is we are seeing that people are transferring money not from one bank to the other, but from banks to either non-banks or funds. Um, when we look at the demographic of what happened in these small runs that we had, you see that people were young, they were following social media a lot. Um, it was very fast. It was trans transferred to funds. In almost two thirds of what happened in the US was to funds, not to other banks. Um, and, and so I think there are some conclusions from that. One is that you can have collective bank runs as opposed to the past, because you can just transfer from the system to outside the system. The second thing is the power of disclosure and the sensitivity to disclosure of data is much higher because you can have a company that will go down and people associate a company to one bank and you could have a bank run there because everybody now is on the social media talking about that. And again, one of the, thing that, that one of the things that was uh, presented was that people were withdrawing money even if they had insured deposits. So this debate about whether you have more insured and uninsured, I think it's also something that will be with us. And I think the, resulting, the results that comes out of that is that banks will look, we need to look at the structure of funding in a different way. You're going to have to have 
funding that is more secure. Some banks that don't pay for funding or don't pay for deposits will start paying. Um, and that changes the balance. And I think Pablo has done an amazing job at the Basel Committee, but I think we will need to supervise banks in a different way from here uh, on, because I think what we saw, uh, it's not only uh, one specific event. I think it's, it reflects a change in behavior. And the last point is, uh, it's always good to explain economics to uh, non-economists, because they always you know, confront you with something and you, and you always puzzle. And I was trying to explain to a non-economist the other day that we have the following situation globally. We have more debt, and I was trying to explain the convexity of the debt and you know, what's the effect of having contracted so much debt at a low rate and how the convexity uh, has a big wealth effect. And we have a higher debt, public and private, uh, much higher. And, you know, um, Pablo and Chief talked about the effect uh, from all the fiscal impulse and the savings that's still there. So on one side, we have more debt. On the, second, on the second part, there seems to be the case that we have higher neutral rates. It could be a little bit higher, not so much higher, but the reality is we are, you know, putting higher numbers in our models. I think there was a question the other day asked by Fabio Kanchuk, which is uh, our director about that. And it was very, I think it was a question asked to, uh, to Gita, or I don't know if it was Fabio or Carlos, but so we have higher debt, we have higher neutral rates, and the other thing is we have lower structural growth. And uh, when we look in the case of Brazil and we look at the questionnaires, the, com the numbers are coming lower and lower. If you look at seven years ago, five years ago, three years ago, and now, and now I talk to most of you economists and I ask you, what's the structural growth for Brazil? And you tell me one and a half percent. And some people say even less. So the reality is when you have this equation, and this is, I am explaining to a non-economist, you have higher debt, you have a much higher neutral rate, so, which means that the rates are going to be higher for longer, and you have a lower structural growth. And so the, 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 the reaction from a non-economist, so we are very pessimistic. Because the picture that you are telling me is that you, you come from a higher level of debt and you're not going to be able to lower rates so much. And by the way, you are not able to grow without producing inflation. And so I, I think the, the, the conclusion here is that we talk too much. Uh, uh, we, I think we spend too much time and it's our job on, you know, uh, in Brazil on the Selic rate, whether it's going to go high and low and what we're going to do. But when we look beyond a little bit that, I think we need to focus on the fact that we need to do structural reforms. We need to do things that lower the neutral rate and increase the structural growth. And when I look at, we, we had, I had a slide on one of the presentations that I look at all the reforms that are being done in the developed countries and in the emerging markets. And we haven't done much reforms in a long time. And I think that refers back to one of the speeches that Augustine had, I think it was on Jackson Hole, which is we need to focus on doing more and more reforms. Because right now, the equilibrium between higher debt, uh, higher neutral rate, and lower structural growth is very damaging. Thank you. So we thank the participants of this session too. And on behalf of Banco Central do Brasil, we thank everyone for their presence and conclude the high-level seminar on central banking, past and present challenges. We kindly request uh, that the headphones for tr simultaneous translation be returned at the exit of this auditorium. And of course, we wish you all a great evening.